Well, great, fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yara Chiano. I'm the Outcomes uh, Assessment Coordinator from Santa Ana College in Southern California. This is day two of our uh, Student Learning Outcomes Symposium number nine. This is the ninth annual edition of the symposium. So we've been at it for, for a number of years now. And, and I tell you, the event has, has grown uh, immensely thanks to, to uh, your support. And, and apparently the message that, that we are forwarding makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. So I'm just very happy uh, to see you all today. Yesterday, we, we had close to 400 people attending the event. Um, the keynote was very, very well received. I believe that uh, he really, as, 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 as we discussed the event uh, later uh, yesterday and this morning, uh, the keynote certainly has put, up, put us on the, on the, on the right track. Um, at, at the end, however, he did say, he did indicate, he made it very clear that, that the work that we are doing is not something that can change the system, change the, uh, our, our way of doing business, change our, our um, accountability measures, pedagogies, and everything that's happening in higher education overnight. So this is something that uh, the, this, this work will, will take uh, quite a bit of effort, and, and it's, it's, it's going to be um, a long-term endeavor. Uh, at the same time, however, I am, I am uh, certainly very optimistic, and, 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 and that's why uh, Dr. Lowe is here to talk about the competency-based education efforts in the state of California. Before we move on there, I just would like to, again, acknowledge uh, the, the, the help from um, Fresno City College. Uh, thank you very much for, for to, to Don Lopez, for uh, Vice President of Instruction from Fresno City College for supporting this. Uh, Enrique Hauerke for uh, as, SLO coordinator from the college. And last but not least, no, 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 not the least, Susie Nitzel is there. And, and I tell you, she's been uh, working, working marvels for us here. So we are just so very happy to have her all the technology issues, she, I, I tell you, she resolved every single one of them. So kudos to her. I just, uh, we, just we just cannot be happier to have her. Uh, so before we, we move on, uh, here is uh, Enrique. Would you please uh, take it away for a moment? And then we'll be moving to the, to the keynote, please. Thank you. On behalf of Fresno City College, I wish you a meaningful SLO symposium. And I hope you take this goodie bag, look inside, and uh, learn something from these experiences. Uh, and so thank you so much. Welcome to day two. But at this time, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our Don Lopez, our Vice President of Instruction. Thank you for your support, Don. Hi, you're most welcome. Thank you, Yarek. And I, I want to uh, echo uh, Yarek on Susie Nitzel, outstanding work that she's done. I appreciate all the work that she's done. And Yarek, uh, our conversation this morning is, um, it's really exciting to see how much you guys have grown this program, over 400 people today from all across the nation participating and on a Saturday, uh, which is uh, kind of phenomenal, getting people up at eight o'clock on Saturday morning. So thank you very much. And uh, we really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to, to join you uh, in this endeavor. So thank you very much and keep up the good work. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And. Uh... Uh, let me see here. I, I would like to, again, like I always do, uh, uh, first of all, acknowledge the moderators. I tell you this year, we've done things a little bit differently and I'm just for, so very grateful for the help and support from uh, outcomes assessment, SLO coordinators, assessment um, committee members and, 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 and whoever is out there in our community college system in California, who, uh, who, whose job it is and, and, and whose heart is in really in, in, in uh, making sure that our students learn and what it means to uh, pay attention to equity and, and, and learning in those, um, in those efforts. So I'm just so very grateful for, for the moderators who have been helping um, manage these, these sessions. And this morning we have um, uh, Steve Ciron, and I don't know if Grace was, was able to log in, I don't see her yet, but uh, Steve Ciron is here and uh, he's going to moderate or at least he's going to introduce Dr. Lowe, if that's okay, Steve, are, 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 are you ready for that? You're still muted. Yes, I am ready. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Would you like me to introduce her now? Please. All right. Uh, so this morning we're gonna hear from Dr. <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Aisha Lowe, who is the Vice Chancellor of uh, for Educational Services and Support 
for the California Community Colleges system. Uh, we're really grateful for having her here this morning with us. So let's welcome her. Welcome. Thank you very, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Steve Yargic, and all of those who have been working tirelessly, I'm sure, behind the scenes uh, to organize this event. <clears throat> it is my pleasure to be here with you this morning. Apologize for my, my froggy voice. I've been a little under the weather. Uh, but I'm excited to be here with you all this morning uh, to talk more about competency-based education uh, and the work that we are doing around competency-based education um, and talk about really sort of the, the vision and the goals of this work, uh, how this work is really essential, uh, we believe, uh, to the future of California Community Colleges um, and just give you an update on our progress and our next steps here. All right, thank you very much. I was just gonna say, I can pull up the slides. Um, that's perfect. All right, uh, next slide, please. Or I can, I, I do have them in slide mode if you all want me to, to pull them up. Sure. All right, mm -hmm. perfect. All right, can everyone see those? Yes. Perfect. So excited to be here with you all for your 2022 uh, symposium uh, to talk more about competency-based education, uh, but really want to start just sort of level setting uh, why competency-based education for our system. Uh, and as we dig into this work around competency-based education, uh, it is definitely uh, an imperative to innovate uh, I have this picture here, of course, um, we are all of the age that we remember Blockbuster, right? Who remembers Blockbuster? I remember uh, Blockbuster being a big part of my childhood, actually. I remember the, the joy of sort of, you know, waiting for Friday night or waiting for the weekend and going to the Blockbuster store. And there were these things called VHS cassettes. Uh, and we would walk up and down the aisles and and you would look at different movies and different titles and and then there was, of course, always that cringing moment when, when you knew what you wanted to watch and then you'd go to the front and they didn't have the cassette and so you couldn't watch it, right? It was a whole experience. Uh, it actually became sort of a cultural moment uh, for the nation to have these. And, and yet now we know that the thought of Blockbuster is obsolete, right? That's not how you watch movies. Uh, now you go onto your device or your television and you speak to your remote and you tell it what you want to watch and it pulls things up for you. Um, and, and as we think about uh, the world of higher education, uh, it feels like a far gone uh, fantasy, right? That what we know as education today, as higher education today could ever be blockbuster. But there are some very real actually threats to uh, the traditional way that we have done higher education. Um, as we think about the continued advances in technology, the continued use and desire for technology, I know we all experienced firsthand how that was quickly accelerated due to the pandemic. As we think about the way uh, economies are shifting, as we think about uh, employer demands and what they're looking for in our students and uh, you know, if you look into the business literature, there, there's sort of a, a constant refrain from business that students are coming out of college and yet still don't have the skills and capabilities that they're looking for. In addition to our students evolving needs, right, this next generations of students are very different uh, than traditional students. They have different ideals. They have different beliefs about what is valuable um, and where to expend their time. And so there's a different way that we're going to have to uh, really establish various modes uh, of engaging in academics and higher education so that we can keep pace with these demands with the continuously uh, expanding economy that we are in as well uh, so that we do not become the blockbusters uh, of the future. And so what are some of those key, key demands that are taking place and shifts that are taking place one, we know that our demographics are shifting uh, significantly in the state of California. Uh, there has been a steady decline in the number of high school graduates. Uh, that decline is projected to continue. Um, and we know that that decline in high school graduates means that the traditional college student, right, that student fresh out of high school uh, who still has the support ideally of their parents who is able to attend school full time 
who is able to come to classes between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., that population is declining and will continue to decline. So it's going to be an imperative for us as the population coming to the doors of the California Community Colleges will increasingly be older working adults that we have programs that have been designed for those older working adults who are managing families as well as work and all of the uh, realities of adulting that we are all quite familiar with. Another key dependency here or sort of a shift in trend and demographics is we know as a state, we are an increasingly diverse state. Um, and we know that uh, a number of those community college students come to us who are not just older working adults, uh, but who are our Latinx, our African-American, our Asian-American students who are looking to enter into a space that has historically and traditionally been closed off to them in higher education to get a, Calif uh, to get a college degree. Uh, we know that there are 6.8 million Californians between the ages of 25 and 54 uh, who do not have a post-secondary degree. Uh, and more than half of those individuals are people of color. So this, there are opportunities not just to shift uh, our practices, shift our institutions for what will be a continually increase in the number of students who are older working adults, but there's also an opportunity here to close equity gaps because we know among those older working adults, we have a large proportion of people of color. Another trend uh, that we have seen and that certainly was exacerbated by the pandemic, there is an increasing desire for online education. Uh, of course, for those of us who have been in the field of education for quite some time, we know that there was a time where uh, the thought of online education um, seemed impossible, right? It seemed far-fetched. It seemed we couldn't quite wrap our minds around how we would replicate what we do so well in the classroom into this online sp space. And yet we know as we enter into the year 2020, this is becoming the norm. Uh, having opportunities to engage in thinking and learning and skill development online is an increasing opportunity. And it is really the competitive space for us now, uh, in particular after the pandemic. Uh, we know not just here in California are these demands increasing, but also specific to the California community colleges over uh, the years, there has been an increasing demand for online. And you see that uptick right from 2014 on to 2020, this doesn't even yet take into account the pandemic effect. Um, and I don't know if you all are experiencing this, this or experiencing this on your campuses, but I've heard from a number of colleges uh, that post pandemic, uh, as colleges you know, went back to increasing the proportion of their in-person classes, the colleges are struggling to get enrollment for their in-person classes, but their online classes are full. This is a moment in history. Right, that is telling us something that while the pandemic pushed us into distance education in ways we were not ready for, but we pivoted quickly, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we did what we needed to do to shift uh, to online education. Our students experienced that. Um, and even for those who were skeptical, uh, they liked it, right? <laughs> there was something about that experience. Uh, perhaps it was the, you know, the greater flexibility in time right, to be able to engage uh, in, in their educational work uh, after hours and, and things of that nature, but they liked it. And we're seeing that in their enrollment trends now that we are not quite post-pandemic, but at least trying to return back to more in-person. So we have to keep that in mind as well. So with all of these factors, the changing demographics of who our students are, the increase for online, uh, it really calls for the need for things like competency-based education, as well as other initiatives uh, like credit for prior learning. Uh, for the sake of equity, for one, right? we know that if, if we do not have these high quality options for students, our students are more likely to be um, recruited into for-profit institutions. Uh, and we see that unfortunately, uh, an unfortunate trend that Black Californians are overrepresented in for-profit colleges. Uh, but a big part of, of that uh, attraction, right, on the front end is self-paced, flexible schedule, uh, right? Uh, we're gonna take your, your prior learning and give you credit for that. All of these things that uh, we know we can do better uh, than, than those for-profit competitors, but we really have to expand our offerings in that space uh, so that we remain a viable option for uh, the citizens of California. 
Uh, we also know that as we expand into competency-based education, uh, that will be helpful in terms of closing equity gaps for our Latinx Californians that are a large proportion of those older working adults. And we also uh, really just want to confront those long-standing systemic inequities um, and inequalities uh, that have often disenfranchised uh, persons of color from higher education, uh, providing programs that fit the needs of older working adults uh, who are managing real life uh, is going to help us to close those gaps. And it also really centers the student, right, in their learning and empowers them to take a greater ownership over their educational experience, right, which is something that we know is important uh, when we, we look into the field of, of andragogy and how we teach uh, adults. But as we started, it, it is also really a sustainability imperative. Uh, times are a changing, right, as the song goes, and we have to innovate and change uh, to keep up with those times. And so competency-based education is really an opportunity to provide high quality, affordable, and self-paced options uh, for those millions of Californians uh, that have a high school diploma but do not have a degree. Uh, we also want to innovate and change, again, just to meet their needs. Uh, we all know this very well as, as an older working adult. Um, I, if, I, if I were looking to re-engage in higher education, uh, right? I'm not sure how I would do that. How could I, I would be looking for a program that could work around my work schedule, right? And work around my life schedule. And so it's imperative for our system that we create those programs so that we can attract those students. That's going to be essential to our enrollment. Uh, and frankly, it's going to be essential to our future as a system that we have those programs. CBE is also an opportunity to really lead with an assets-based mindset to recognize uh, students' lived experiences, their strengths and their capabilities, uh, right? All of our students are adults. You notice I keep using the language older working adults uh, because all of our students are adults, right? The majority of our students are 18 years old or older. Uh, they are all adults. They have lived experiences. Many of them have been in the workforce. Uh, they have overcome oftentimes uh, difficulties uh, that we can't even imagine that has strengthened their capacity and their resiliency. Uh, they are parenting, they are volunteering, they are leading organizations. They come to us with great strengths and capabilities. I mean, a part of the vision of CBE is that designing programs uh, that will recognize and honor that lived experience. Uh, and ultimately, this is also going to help us fulfill our mission uh, at the California Community Colleges and continue to improve student outcomes toward the goals of the vision for success. So lots of reasons, uh, I believe compelling reasons for us to invest in direct assessment competency-based education, which is the effort that is currently underway uh, within our system. So let's talk a little bit more about what is this thing, competency-based education, and in particular direct assessment, CBE, uh, which is the type of CBE we're, we're moving forward in our system. So one of the key factors of competency-based education is that it focuses on mastery of competencies. Uh, so CBE is really pushing against uh, sort of the, the status quo, and the tradition of how we engage in higher education. It is uh, turning the credit model upside down, really dismantling uh, the credit hour model uh, where we focus on seat time, right? And we, we give students credit for showing up, uh, for being in that seat. And we ultimately give them credit and allow them to pass and exit our class at, at minimal levels of proficiency, all right? They do not have to actually have mastered the material. Uh, they rarely have to demonstrate that they can take that learning and actually apply it within the discipline. Uh, they, they sat in our seat, they put in their time, they pass typically some sort of exam uh, or some sort of uh, writing assignment uh, that, that was at least uh, at those minimal proficient levels. We pass them on, they continue on to the next class. In competency-based education, we completely flip that model where the focus is on mastery of the content and students actually have to demonstrate mastery of that content at a high level. A C is no longer a passing grade within competency-based education. And the focus there is really on allowing students the flexibility uh, to work their way through content, to work towards mastering that content on their own time. Because within competency-based education, the learning is fixed, right? All students 
have to demonstrate mastery at, a, at an equal level, but it's the time that's flexible. Some students may move more quickly than others. It also leaves open the opportunity that if life happens, uh, a student is not completely derailed from their progress. Uh, they don't quote unquote fail the class or need to withdraw from the class because life has happened. It will simply take them longer to work their way through the material. Uh, in line with the demands that you saw for online, uh, these programs are typically fully online or hybrid, and, and it also uh, provides a lot of flexibility around the academic term as well. So key distinguishing factors around CPE, not based on academic terms or the credit hour, uh, based on the evaluation of students' achievement uh, of mastering competencies. That uh, will determine their progress through a program and their ultimate a conferral of a degree or credential. The student is proceeding at their own pace, uh, which is very different uh, than our traditional notion of academic terms. Conventional grades are not necessarily assigned within the competency-based education uh, regulations uh, that we pass within our system. Students will not receive traditional grades. They will be at mastery or mastery plus, and mastery requires a high level of demonstration of competence at 80% or higher. And we also within direct assessment CBE, um, in order to live within the realities of financial aid, right? And, and, and our funding systems, uh, what we then do is create credit hour equivalencies for students learning and their learning outcomes uh, so that we can na navigate the realities of some of those dependencies around finances. And so we're going to talk a little bit more now about where we are with this work. Um, a lot of work has been done to sort of establish uh, this, you know, understanding and definition of direct assessment competency-based education. A uh, very special thank you always to uh, the statewide academic senate and our statewide uh, 5C curriculum committee uh, who rolled up their sleeves and literally, uh, we can literally thank them, literally uh, went through many months of engaging in learning about CBE, uh, learning about how to implement CBE, and literally wrote uh, what is a very lengthy set of <laughs> regulations for direct assessment competency-based education. Uh, those have been officially chaptered by the state of California. Uh, so within our Title V regulations, we do now have uh, authorization uh, to provide direct assessment CBE programs for our system. We are beginning those programs uh, as four credit degree programs, right, associate degree programs. But as we sort of work out the kinks, uh, figure out uh, how to make this work within our system, we will then further expand uh, into non-credit programs, credentials, and other areas. So why then uh, does CBE become one of the answers? And we have to be clear, it's, it's an option. It's one of the answers uh, that we believe will help with these shifting and changing demographics. And part of the reason uh, that uh, CBE matches well uh, with the ways in which that uh, California and our citizenry and our demographics are changing uh, is because of how CBE operates and how it works and ultimately because of what it requires us to do as an institution in order to implement it. Uh, it really does uh, require us to, while we honor the past, it requires us to move into the future, uh, to innovate, not just uh, how teaching and learning will happen in the classroom, it's gonna require us to innovate student services, uh, financial aid, counseling, uh, it will really push innovation across the campus because it touches everything in every office. Um, it's really a, a complex change, but uh, once the groundwork is laid, one that can be brought to scale, and it also really pushes on mindset. That's another reason uh, why we believe this is going to be a helpful innovation, because it forces us to rethink uh, what we believe has to be, uh, right? And I think we learned that so well during the pandemic, things that we said could never happen. Uh, well, my God, we had to do it overnight, and we made it happen. All right, so even though uh, COVID is certainly not a celebrated thing, the pandemic has certainly pushed us to understand that we can do anything um, and we can transform our institutions in any ways that we need to, uh, to ensure the success of our students and the vitality of our organizations. And so CBE is not just another program. That's essential to understand. Uh, as we implement direct assessment CBE, 
Um, it is not program planning as usual. It is literally going to innovate teaching and learning. It's going to innovate infrastructure across the entire campus. But it's going to lead to transformation and innovation in ways that will be helpful for us because it's going to push us toward the very demands uh, that society and our changing demographics are requiring of us. So what are some of those things we're going to have to do? There's a lot of ways in which we have to dismantle the status quo in order to implement CBE. That reliance on seat time is a big one, uh, right? Really transitioning from understanding uh, what it means for a student to have done their part, right? To have fulfilled uh, their part of, of of the agreement uh, within the academic work from the time they spent in a seat to the time that they spend engaging in material, which we then measure through assessing their ability uh, to be able to apply that material, right? So very different way of thinking about how we assess whether or not students have done their part. Uh, we're going to have to dismantle uh, the traditional academic calendar, the notion of Semesters and quarters and intercession does not exist within CBE. Students have to have the flexibility uh, such that you may have one student uh, who has a strong background in a particular content area. They work through a set of CBE competencies and modules within two months. The same student enroll in the same program needs to be able to take six months. How do we transition um, our infrastructure to allow for that sort of flexibility? We're going to have to innovate around student services, right? Students having access to services Monday through Friday, nine to five. Uh, we already learned from the pandemic in general, it really doesn't work for all any of our students, but in particular within CBE, because it is self-paced, uh, students need to be able to get access to student services in the evening, on the weekends, all right? So we're going to have to innovate and think about how we transition student services and student support and then uh, grading, uh, right? Again, here, this is not our, our traditional uh, scale of A through F. This is about mastery. Uh, students do not fail. They keep going until they master the content. Uh, and so what does it mean for the ways we think about the classroom, the ways we think about pedagogy, the ways we think about teaching and learning uh, to shift to a place where it's about mastery of content? Uh, so a lot of things that we will have to push on, um, and I'll talk in a minute about the CBE collaborative, the pilot that's taking place right now, uh, where we have eight brave community colleges that have signed up to be our guinea pigs, uh, to be those early implementers that are working through uh, figuring these things out right now. But uh, there are other areas here where we have to innovate uh, more specific to the teaching and learning process. Program design looks very different within competency-based education. Uh, we have to take what we traditionally think of in terms of a course uh, that has a set of uh, SLOs, uh, where we typically might, you know, sort of chart out across our syllabus, uh, really based in time around the term, what topics we're going to introduce in, when, what assignments students are going to do when. We have to dismantle all that and break it down into these smaller chunks of competencies. What is it that students need to be able to know and do as they engage in a particular set of content. And then another thing we're really gonna have to uh, innovate around here is then assessment, right? What assessment will then show us uh, that they have actually mastered that content. And so within CBE, we're gonna really lean into authentic assessment and performative assessment. These are, these are not multiple choice fill in the blank assessments. These are the type of assessments uh, that would allow us to be able uh, to assess that a student not only remembers uh, what they learn, but they not only understand what they learn, but that they can actually apply it as they should within the discipline. Uh, so that authentic and performative, performative assessment is going to be central. Uh, program standards, I won't go over all of these. Uh, another big one that I will mention though is the faculty role. The faculty role looks very different with incompetency-based education. And you see this term unbundled roles. So imagine this, because right now for us, this is quite different, but imagine you have design faculty, faculty who are designing uh, these competencies, these modules, uh, designing them uh, within the appropriate online platform. Those design faculty may not ever teach that course, but they have designed the course. 
Uh, you then have instructional faculty that are playing that role that we more traditionally understand in terms of being the instructor of record uh, and working with a set of students as they're working their way through competencies and modules. Sometimes in CBE, you also then see uh, some CBE programs even unbundle who the assessment faculty is so that the instructor uh, who's engaging with the student is not necessarily the same instructor who is then scoring and grading their, their authentic assessment. And then you then also typically have uh, an instructor that's playing more of a mentoring role. So it's a very different format uh, where the faculty role is unbundled and as a faculty member, a faculty member could be playing different roles across different programs. And all of those different parts and pieces then have to make up their faculty load. That's gonna be a fun one for us to figure out how that's going to work. We have to figure it out. So, so don't ask me, how is that gonna work? We don't know. We're gonna figure it out though, uh, because it's important that we figure these things out. But so many areas, rep repetition and withdrawal, uh, so many areas where we will have to create new processes, new procedures, new policies. So hopefully I haven't scared you, hopefully I've excited you that while this is a lot, um, it's a wonderful opportunity for campus-wide transformation. And frankly, as we reflect back on where I, where I started, it's a necessary opportunity. We have to do this. And not just this, right? Whether it's this, whether it's high flex, uh, whether it's credit for prior learning, we have got to start to figure out how do we create programs that really meet the needs of older adult working students because those are the students that we will be increasingly serving. So CBE will touch everything. Uh, these are areas that we're working through through the CBE Collaborative, uh, really come up with the answers, right? Of how do we do all these things, right? We know what has to be done, but how do we do them? How do we dismantle silos? And how do we create a process for students where they are at the center of the process and all of the infrastructure is built around them, right? As opposed to we have built infrastructure, we invite students to then come and engage with the infrastructure we built in, and we hope that it works for them. How do we flip that on its head, right? That we design around them with the focus being on their needs and their realities. Um, and it's gonna be a great opportunity for innovation, not an easy task or a simple task, uh, but one that we're certainly excited to take on and to figure out. So where are we at with implementation? <clears throat> we have been working at this for quite some time. It really began uh, with engaging the Board of Governors. There was a presentation in January of 2020 uh, and a report that had come out uh, about the opportunity for CBE, uh, what it is and why it was important for us to engage in that opportunity. We then began in the multi-month work that I mentioned uh, with the statewide curriculum committee uh, to establish the Title V regulations those went before the Board of Governors in September um, of uh, 2020. Uh, they were approved uh, by the Board of Governors. They have now been officially uh, approved and, and chaptered by the state of California. And then we launched into the collaborative. Uh, so those eight colleges, uh, we began working with them uh, in June of 2021. We are working towards uh, their ACCJC approval for their CBE programs uh, this spring and fall. Um, and working towards uh, the actual launch of these programs by 2024. So the work is happening, but there's much to be done. So within this, this multi-year collaborative, uh, we have colleges working in close coordination with the chancellor's office. So unlike some other pilots, this is not a pilot where you know, we gave colleges money and the regulations and said, hey, go figure this out. This literally is a learning community. Uh, so we are working together uh, to figure out together how do we change our infrastructure, how do we change our policies and our practices so that we can have successful CBE programs. That included, of course, seed money uh, for those institutions, uh, but they're getting hands-on support for developing their programs and transforming their infrastructure. Uh, we're also researching the process. What we want to come out of this, out of the pilot, it's not just that those eight colleges successfully establish a CBE program, but that we learn from the process so that we can create a blueprint for the rest of the system. So that those who come after these initial eight early adopters will have a much easier time, will have more answers, will have a process and plan laid out 
Um, and so we're researching the process uh, carefully to make sure we can call from this experience of uh, the knowledge that we need to create a blueprint uh, for continued improvement and for broader system-wide implementation. So if you do not know, uh, you see here uh, on the map, our eight participating collaborative colleges. We are so thankful to them uh, for raising their hands to jump in with us uh, to be the first to experiment um, and figure out CBE for our system. Each one of those colleges established a planning team. So we've got about 175 participants in total. And again, this is a learning community. They engage in monthly learning sessions. Uh, each college has a lead who's sort of coordinating the effort on, the, on their campus. They then engage in an additional monthly meeting of those leads. Uh, like uh, we wanted to sort of um, sort of uh, replicate what CBE is about, uh, even within this learning experience. So there's a fully integrated Canvas course with material. Um, and so your colleagues are really working through this as, as if they are in the classroom. Uh, there is reading to be done. There's reflection to be done. Uh, they then take that information back to their campus for further discussion and reflection. And then we come together once a month and work on a particular uh, problem of practice. Uh, so they are committing quite a bit. So we are so thankful to these colleges, <coughs> excuse me, to their leadership um, and to all of those who are participating on these implementation teams for the work that they are doing. Uh, this is a highly supported effort. We have support from the Success Center out of the Foundation for California Community Colleges. Uh, we have secured the support of Jobs for the Future. They're really sort of project managing this massive effort for us. I'm in helping to coordinate all the pieces, finding all of the necessary subject matter experts, and really helping us to design a strong learning experience. We have strong support from the Competency-Based Education Network, national organization of CBE experts, uh, who are hand in hand with us in designing not just this learning experience, are giving our colleges one-on-one -on -one and individualized coaching as they work their way through this experience, as well as the RAND Corporation, who is doing a thorough, uh, a thorough developmental evaluation of this work so that, again, we can learn from the work and ultimately produce a blueprint for the rest of the system. As those uh, collaborative colleges come together, um, they, they are working in a number of different ways. Uh, again, they're getting individualized coaching, which is essential. They are producing artifacts along the way, right? So they have assignments as they produce different pieces uh, of, of what they need to do to develop their program, like creating their competencies, competency sets um, as an assignment, thinking through student recruitment. Um, and so as they continue that work, all of that uh, is just organized together with a group of resources and support to help them make their way through the process and ultimately for us to establish strong programs. And so while we are deep into the work, uh, we are still really at the beginning of the process. Some initial work was done uh, even before colleges applied to start to establish infrastructure needed locally on their campus for this innovation to select their program. And, and we are here in the design your program phase. So our collaborative colleges are designing their competency sets. Uh, they're really working through, uh, we're starting to talk at our next session about how do you do that in general education? Right? It's one thing to do that in a discipline. How do we take our general education courses and translate those into competencies and competency sets? We'll then move into operational transformation, right? which will be a whole other set of work. Campuses will need to bring in the necessary individuals from various offices across the campus and then looking to launch those programs in 2024. And then the collaborative actually continues after launch for some continued research and scalability. Uh, so we're excited for the work uh, and the progress that our colleges are making. But even as we talk about this great opportunity, the reality is there's still so many areas and elements of policy that we have to figure out. And that's a big part of the collaborative. Uh, really establishing program quality standards uh, in an approval process, um, as well as academic and course approval processes and standards. Understanding how can we innovate the academic term um, and academic calendars to make room for this. Uh, establishing a methodology for creating those credit hour equivalencies so that we can map back to uh, the credit hour because it still exists, right? And we still have to work within those confines so for the purpose of financial aid, for the purposes of uh, transcript, 
right? While our programs are developing competencies and modules that all roll up into the program, we then have to backwards map it to the traditional credit hour uh, because that's what four years are going to want to see on a transcript, right? And that's what's needed for financial aid. And so that's a big part of the process um, is establishing a methodology to make that process easy. Ultimately, um, establishing and innovating around grading systems and then aligning direct assessment CBE course criteria for associate degree standards. So, so much work for us to do. Uh, last thing I'll mention before we can open it up for, for any Q&A, if we have time for that, um, Yarik, is that in addition to this work that is moving forward uh, with the CBE Collaborative, <clears throat> we also have a set of work that we're just beginning around uh, really investigating and figuring out can we innovate uh, for us, for California, for the California Community Colleges, can we innovate our funding and apportionment model to be more flexible uh, for CBE and really for the system at large? Uh, so that work is just beginning. We have secured uh, the support of an organization called Volta Learning Group, a longtime CBE experts who are sort of uh, among the pioneers who pioneered competency-based education for the nation uh, to really dig into our, our regulations and for us to have some conversations about, um, as opposed to being stuck in the place of always having to do the credit hour equivalencies, can we create a new funding model uh, that would be more flexible and allow for CBE? And, and what might that teach us about how we might have a more flexible funding model in general for all of our work in all of, in all of our types of programs and courses? So that's we won't have answers for that for, for quite some time. That's uh, probably another year or two down the way, but just also wanted to mention that that work is also taking place. And with that, I will stop uh, and hand it back to you, Yarg, for questions. All right, so Hi. yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Dr. Lowe, for the update. This is very insightful, and as far as I'm concerned, very inspirational. So thank you very much for your, for your thoughts. Uh, indeed, there's been uh, a number of questions in the in the chat here, and uh, uh, Grace Estrada is here, and so is Steve Cerrone. Please uh, take it away. If you could please summarize the discussion and just just uh, see what it is that people are asking. Uh, let me let me step in here from a hello, Dr. Lowe. Nice, it's so good that you're here with us this morning. Thank you. Um, so there were a couple of interesting questions that came up in the question and answer. Uh, posting section. Um, the first one uh, has to do with CTE course enrollments and whether or not you see CTE course enrollments also increasing um, based off of the information that you're providing. Is, is, is this, is the increased demand uh, for college courses gonna be centered on CTE or do you see it more across the board? That's a great question. I, I think it will be across the board, but I, I love this question because this is another area uh, where uh, you know we need to innovate, right? We we really need to dismantle, right, all of these lines, right? These these sort of false dichotomies that we have established, right? We're like this is CTE, right? This is vocational ed. This is academic ed. Uh, what we would like to see is that it becomes the norm across all programs, no matter what the discipline is or what type of, whether it's degree or credential a student is working towards, uh, that that notion of career and technical education is a part of what all students do, right? Um, I'd like to think some students are, you know, in, enroll in college for the love of learning. I hope there's a few, but most of them, right, are enrolling in college toward career and technical outcomes, right? They are looking to upskill, to reskill, uh, to uh, get a promotion at their current job, to switch uh, and, and get into uh, another work field. And so we want to bring that together. And that's something that's uh, actually sort of baked into the competency-based education uh, regulations is that these programs have to bring together theory and practice. They have to bring together, right, the theoretical uh, the, the knowledge that students need for a particular discipline, but they, it has to weave in and incorporate then uh, the, the applicable and the practical. What does the student actually need to do uh, out in the world, in the field, uh, once they go in, into their particular discipline as a worker? So bringing that together. And so I do believe though, right, to get more to the heart of the question, uh, that we will see increasing demand 
for programs that are focused on what we traditionally think of as CTE. Because what this new generation of students is showing us is they don't want to spend a lot of time. They don't want to spend years on our campuses anymore. They don't, right? They don't want to spend years on our campuses uh, exploring, right? Which was, there was a time where, where that was an important thing in prior generations. We partly went to college to explore, right? There was a whole notion of, oh, college is the time to go figure out who you are, right? And, and to learn about yourself and explore different disciplines. These, these next rounds of generations, they don't seem to share that same ideology. They don't want to spend a lot of time. They want to come into a program. They want to know what career outcome that program is going to lead to, and they want to do it as quickly as possible. So I definitely think there's going to be increased demand uh, in general uh, for those sort of programs. Thank you. Let me follow up uh, with another question from, from the chat, which is, which is related, I think. Um, this question, I'll read it to you. Uh, am I incorrect in my perception that the faculty role is described here through CBE is more comparable to K through 12 education than the higher education model we currently operate under? This seems to really reverse advances made in the past of our, uh, that, that get our community college system to be seen more of, of higher ed. No, that's a great question. I, I mean, my answer to that would be no, right? Uh, when you think about CBE, I want you to think more the Socratic method of teaching. All right, this is not at all a reversal to K-12. This is actually pushing our understanding of the role of the faculty member and the ways in which we design opportunities for students to engage in authentic learning. Right, so it's shifting us right from sort of that history of the sage on the stage, right, who is lecturing. It's shifting us to understanding we are working with adults. They are intelligent. They are capable. Right, they can perform at high levels. How do we design a learning experience for them? Whereas a faculty member, you are their facilitator of learning. Right, you are their guide through this journey of this material. Um, and in some ways, it's more that Socratic method, right, uh, of learning and teaching that allows students to engage in material, to think and explore, and the faculty member is then playing that role of, of being a thought partner with them, helping them uh, to learn and understand, helping them to think through application, and then ultimately assessing, uh, right, at the end of a particular module, can they demonstrate that they understood um, and that they can actually now perform something, do something as an application of that learning. Uh, so not at all, not at all a, re a retreat to anything of the old. This is really about pushing uh, and innovating our, our thinking about the teaching and learning process into the future. Hey, thank you, Dr. Lowe. Um, personally, I'm very excited by your discussion. Uh, so we have a few questions. Uh, James is asking, how does the college help create a sense of community and social interaction for students online or on site under the CBE model? I'm curious about this because students work at their own pace. No, absolutely. That's a great question. And I think that's a great question in general for online education, right? It's, it's definitely, I think, uh, something that's going to be essential, not just for CBE, but for higher ed, for us to really figure out how do we maintain community in an online format, because that's certainly one of the pieces uh, that you hear often from students is the piece that they miss when they are in an online environment. Um, and so in some ways that is different, right, within competency-based education, because students are working at a different pace, uh, right, they're not necessarily in a space where, you know, they, they're going to come together and all talk about this one problem, right, or this one activity or this one exercise. Uh, what there's still uh, definitely room for, though, within the CBE program um, is what we often see happen organically, but we would have to be intentional about structuring it, is those opportunities for students to support one another, right? So that student who's having an easy time with the content uh, and working their way through a set of competencies, uh, being able to support and mentor that student who is struggling. Uh, so, of course, when you're doing that online, you have to build that intentionally. It's not going to organically happen the way it often does in our in-person classrooms. And so we'll just have to be strategic, right, about sewing that in and making sure there, there are those opportunities for students to connect and not just around the content,
but I would say also uh, around um, you know industry and job opportunities, internship opportunities, areas where they could actually come together and you know be working at a particular organization or uh, getting an opportunity uh, to sort of shadow uh, at a particular organization to see the future of the discipline that they're working towards. So there are ways to do it, but we'll have to be intentional in making sure that we design for that uh, and have that in mind. Thank you. Um, well, there are a few more questions, but it seems thematically it has to do with integrating the CBE model with employers and partners. Um, so how how is uh, going is going to facilitate <clears throat> excuse me partnerships between colleges and local employers and how is this going to coincide with the existing structure that we have right now? So that's a great question. This is actually an area where um, where CBE is very well suited. So when we think about what we currently do now for CTE curriculum. Right, and how included within that is the labor market analysis, included within that is the expectation, uh, right, that we're actually connecting with employers regionally to understand their needs. That is baked into the process for designing a CBE program, right? So again, we're dismantling that wall between this is academic and this is CTE. CBE brings them together into one unified program. So it is a, a required part uh, within the Title V regulations of designing your CV program, but you're doing that labor market analysis, it's the connecting directly with employers uh, to understand their needs and what they are looking for in the grad in graduates who would uh, come from your program uh, into, into their particular workforce. And CV is also ripe for taking that a step further and actually designing partnership with those employers that your students will complete the CBE program, and then that employer has a spot waiting for some number of students at the end of the completion of the program. CBE is actually designed uh, with that purpose and that outcome in mind. Hey, Dr. Hello. Um, I have another question. Um, this is actually one of my own. Uh, one of the things that you spoke of that um, maybe a little bit concerned is, is the idea of removing the structures, let's say, of the, of the kind of education that we have now, the educational system we have now, eliminating the semester, eliminating or, or, or making it more uh, um, fluid, let's say, um, in a lot of ways. And, and as somebody who's, who's really struggled these last couple of years uh, through this COVID scenario because of a lack of structure. I'm someone who loves to go to, to, the, to the campus, loves to go to the classroom. Um, how, how is this model going to, um, will this model allow for still like more structured uh, delivery of, of, of education or, or, or are we like completely blowing up. I know that we want to completely blow up the system, <laughs> which is a good thing, but but how how is this going to affect traditional structure? No, that's a great question. So a couple of things I will say, right? We, we have to remember, right, that CBE is an additional tool we're adding to our tool bill, right? It's not going to replace everything that we do, but it's a set of programs that we want to and we should have available for our campus for those students for whom that's going to fit, right? To your point, Steve, for the student who can't come to campus, right? Because they work all day and then they come home and there's dinner and children and homework and they need to be in class at 9 p.m., right? <laughs> or, or, or Sunday afternoon, right? So we wanna remember, this is adding something. This is additive. It's adding another opportunity uh, for our system to proliferate a set of programs that is really gonna work for, in particular, uh, that older working adult who needs that flexibility. And there will also be some younger adults who want that flexibility as well. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind though is, while it's not um, within the brick and mortar structure, the program is highly structured, right? So the, we're talking about uh, a set of competencies that are scaffolded the same way we do now in our classes, right? Or scaffolding the learning, chunking it out and scaffolding it, building it upon itself. A set of competencies that roll up into a module that is then an assessment uh, for a student to demonstrate that they've mastered the material, the competencies in that module before they move on to the next one. So these are highly structured programs. 
Uh, but to, to that piece of, you know, how do you keep the student um, who, who's missing, right? Sort of that, that, that moment of being in the classroom and seeing that, that, that professor, that authority figure there looking at them, right? <laughs> that sort of compels them to keep going. With NCBE, that is where the role of the mentoring faculty comes in. The mentoring faculty member is the bridge for the student between student services and the classroom. Right, so the mentoring faculty member is has a uh, think of it as a caseload, has a caseload of students that they're working with, and they are checking where students are in their progress. They are directly reaching out to students, right, and having the necessary conversations with them. Uh, whether the student is stuck on some some particular aspect of student services or an administrative thing they need to get done, or whether it's in the classroom. And so they have sort of this direct point person and this mentoring faculty member who is there to ensure, to your point, that they don't just fall through the crack or cease to make progress. Uh, they have an individual who is there to coach them and mentor them and keep them moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Very exciting possibilities. Grace, would you like to ask the next yeah, one? Sure, thank you. Kind of, and you addressed um, quite a few questions that are kind of talking about the social interaction component. Um, there's one here that says, uh, you mentioned the issue of credit hour equivalency for students transferring to four-year colleges. What other issues exist for smooth transfer? Yeah, so this is going to, to be an important one. And, and do know part of our job is we've been having the necessary conversations uh, in particular for our two main partners, CSU and UC, for them to understand what this is, uh, what we're doing and what they'll see coming uh, down the pike in the not too distant future. And so it's that crosswalk back to the traditional uh, transcript. So what you will often see in competency-based education programs, um, many of them, uh, they, they have sort of a CVE transcript uh, that's really looking at the completion of competencies and modules but because of the credit hour equivalencies, they're able to walk that back to a traditional transcript, uh, which is needed for transfer. And so we're talking about programs. So for example, in our collaborative, uh, none of our colleges are creating brand new programs. They're taking programs that currently exist, right? That have already been approved on their campuses that are, uh, you know, already, some of them already set up um, to articulate to, uh, for transfer and then what we do within CBE is sort of dismantle and unbundle it into smaller chunks for the process of learning, but the four-year institution will get the same transcript, right? So that's part of how you avoid there being complications really in the transfer process is ensuring that you have that traditional transcript that, uh, that the, that the four-year institution will see the way they traditionally like to see it in terms of courses that have been articulated uh, already with the four-year institution, uh, so that they can do their piece. Now, would we like to innovate past that? I would say yes, at some point in the future, but that's way in the future, right? There's a lot more work uh, that would have to be done with our four-year partners to get them to the point uh, where they have CBE aligned programs for our students to transfer into. Uh, but right now the path forward is the credit hour equivalencies, mapping back to the traditional transcript uh, so that students can uh, have those same opportunities for transfer. Thank you. Actually, your answer um, brought up a question I have with that in terms of walking back to a traditional transcript. Um, based on your model of mastery, then does that mean every student would pretty much get a B or an A because of, because of the level of mastery that we're talking about? Exactly, right? So one thing we can know, and apologies, the gardener just arrived, it's Saturday morning. Um, one thing we can know is uh, on, on that traditional transcript, students from CBE programs will be coming in with higher GPAs, right? right? And th that will hopefully be another, you know, helpful uh, sort of selling point with our four-year partners. Um, and they'll see it over time. We're, we'll be able to see, okay, no, when a student completes a CBE program, they are coming to you with a higher level of mastery uh, than what you might traditionally see. Hello, another question is related to this topic, how um, how have our partners, CSU and UC, responded to this work? And how do you see uh, this transformation at the community college level affecting uh, other, other institutions? Is it possible for 
for, for instance, for California to embrace this transformation across the board instead of just in pieces? No, that's a great question. I do think we'll get there. Um, it, it'll be some years away, but I think we'll, we'll get there. So for example, I think the perfect example is with credit for prior learning, right? Uh, we Legislation came our way for credit for prior learning. We instituted new policy and implementing that we make sure to bring uh, the necessary uh, leaders from CSU and UC into the room as we develop the policy. The result of that is then CSU has now implemented and updated their policy for credit for prior learning to be in alignment with ours. So I think we will continue to see that in some initial conversations in particular with uh, CSU leadership, uh, they talked about how they're thinking through and experimenting with something similar. They're not calling it competency-based education, uh, but they're thinking through similarly, how do they create the kind of programs that will be well aligned for older working adults, right, who need flexibility. Um, and so they are also thinking through some sort of pilot that they uh, are intending to engage in um, in the next year or so uh, to do something similar. So I definitely think as we continue to push uh, having the necessary conversations and educating and also doing the mind, mindset shifting work with our four-year partners, I can foresee a future, now future future, maybe 10 years down the road, right, where we have sets of CBE programs across all of our institutions um, and even ways that we could perhaps align them so that there's a natural transition uh, for our students. Because that's another thing that we often reflect on is for students to engage, <coughs> excuse me, in a CBE program within our system and then transfer to their four year and they're back in a traditional learning environment, right? So ideally it would be nice to even have our students be able to leave a CBE program in our system and then go on to a CBE program uh, at a four year institution. So down the line, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get there. Thank you. Does anyone, does Grace, do you have any other questions to um, ask? Looking here, and um, I think we have addressed the questions. Um, yeah. I, I have a question with regards to this idea of the students enroll in a class and then they keep going basically until they master it. So it almost sounds like a pay once <laughs> model where no matter how long it takes, they are going to get that education. Um, so I'm just wondering how that is going to integrate with our existing system, you know? No, that's a great question, uh, Grace. And that's why I mentioned that additional work that's being done on establishing a funding model for CBE, because it cannot be a pay once and then we serve you for the next two years model, right? right? That's not, uh, that's not uh, financially uh, sustainable, right? So we're going to have to create a model uh, that sort of allows for, again, for funding to be flexible as a student moves. Um, and so that's part of the work as well. The, the state of California is very supportive of this work. They actually provided $10 million uh, in last year's budget for us to innovate such a model, right? To create a flexible model uh, for competency-based education uh, so that uh, you know, it's honoring the work and the movement of the student and honoring the work the institution is putting into that student uh, so that you know, it's sort of flexible pay, but also fair pay to the college as a student is moving along. And there are also guardrails, right? A, a student can't just sort of flounder for, for years at end they're, and they're still in the same module. So within the regulations, there are guardrails um, around the number of times a student can attempt to master a particular assessment. <coughs> There's guardrails there about, you know, if a student is not doing well in the CBE program, making sure that there are policies and processes to transport them then uh, to a different program if CBE doesn't seem to be working for them. So there are some, some guardrails that have been established uh, to, to ensure that students are making real progress and to give them a different option if it turns out the CBE is not a good fit for them. Okay, thank you. It is really exciting and, um just this idea of really centering the students in their education. I love that idea of changing that infrastructure for them. Um, Steve or Yarek, did you want any anything else? I don't think we have any more. Yes, 
Th thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Yes, fantastic. We have our, our speakers have arrived. I just have one, one parting question for Dr. Lowe. Since the CBE provisions uh, in, are already in Title V, right? We, we, it's, it's part of the law by now. Uh, how soon or, or, or what, what would you advise if there are colleges who, ha who perhaps have those fledgling efforts to, to get things going? Is, is it okay for them to, to jump on board or, or what, what, what guidance would you offer, if any? No, that's a great question, Yark, and I'm going to lean in and make sure you all can hear me over the, the gardening happening out here. So technically, yes, right? The regulations have been officially chaptered. You do not have to be a part of the collaborative uh, to sort of jump in, dig in, um, and start to work through this on, on your local campus. Um, now, the caveat would be, right, there's so much we have not yet figured out, right? So the difficulty would be, right, if a college is sort of trying to get ahead and just go ahead and jump in and implement on their own is the purpose of the collaborative is to answer all those remaining policy questions that we don't yet have answers to. Um, but certainly colleges should feel welcome. Um, and thank you, Cheryl, for posting that. Um, and of course, a big shout out to Cheryl. I, I, for, I forgot to mention this. Cheryl was chairing 5C when we went through this effort and, and her leadership was absolutely beautiful and essential. Um, so colleges can jump in, but the caveat is, we don't have all the answers. We haven't figured it all out. And so that's the purpose of the collaborative is for us to create a roadmap uh, that will make clear how to do all of this work. Uh, but certainly would encourage any colleges that are interested in digging into the regulations to, if you know you want to start a competency-based education program, start that initial work on your campus, right? That's what you can begin now, having the conversations to start to educate your campus about what this is and why you should invest in it, right? Start to think through what might be our first CBE program uh, that we would want to design. So there's certainly work that can be done on the front end to lay the groundwork, to do the teaching, the educating, the mindset shifting so that uh, you'll, your campus will be ready to jump in and, and move forward uh, once we have some of the policy uh, questions resolved. Right on. Well, thank you very much again for inspiration, for guidance, for the for the words of encouragement, and 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 again, it's 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 going to be a lot of work, but but we on the right path, and and it's true, the vision is there. So I I certainly again appreciate your uh, sharing this with us. So thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank for, you, everyone. For joining us and for your support. Uh, so we'll we'll certainly stay in touch. We'll let you know how how our, our community here is responding to all this. So thanks again for your support. Thank you very much. Alrighty then, and now if we could move to our next uh, uh, part of the program. Um, so uh, Steve and Grace, before we start talking about our, our next speakers, uh, if you could please, and I think that, um, yes, we, oh, Beth Dark. is here. Yes, Amber's yes. here. Oh, Amber's here, super, already then. So we have a, a lot of people to help us. So if you could please, uh, just like we did with Dr. Lowe, right? Just to summarize the, the, the questions that we have here. And uh, Amber is here from um, El Camino College. Good morning. Compton College. Compton. It's called Compton now. All right. So <laughs> yes. see you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad you, you, you managed. So again, I, I apologize. Thank you again, Dr. Lowe, for, for, for the, for the uh, perspective on, on, on CBE for us. Uh, and again, we have enough people to, to help us moderate discuss, the discussion. And now I have a great pleasure to, to uh, introduce the um, speakers from Western Governors University who are going to share their experience with Western, uh, at, at, of, uh, Western Governors University and Open Skills Networks Network. And that's those, those uh, two entities, two organizations uh, have been supportive of competency-based education programs as we, as we know them. So um, I know that our system, our mm -hmm. California community college system, uh, Cheryl will probably speak to this uh, later. Um, we have quite a bit of, 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 of link there. We are looking at what it is that Western Governors uh, University experience has been and, and what it is that, that they are doing. And then Open Skills uh, Network is, is an organization that just originated uh, oh, probably over a year ago. We'll, we'll, we'll hear more details about this. So again, with a great pleasure, I would like to introduce Sarah DeMarc from uh, Western Governors and Casey Thorne. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate this. I hope you didn't have much of a problem with, with technology. We, we, we switched to Zoom uh, events, which, which apparently has 
uh, has caused some difficulty logging in, but I'm, 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 I'm just so happy to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. The well, floor is yours. Thank you for, for having us. We're, we're happy to be here as well. Um, and yeah, no problems. I think we're all just sort of navigating this virtual hybrid world. So um, I think that's kind of the, the skill for today is to be nimble in uh, figuring out all the different uh, technology platforms. So yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, so hi, I'm uh, Sarah DeMarc. I am, um, my title is uh, slightly changed and I see there's a misspelling in it anyway, but I'm the, the Vice Provost of uh, Workforce Intelligence and Credential Integrity. And um, I am joined by my uh, fantastic colleague, um, Casey Thorne, who is our Director of Skills Architecture. And we're gonna be um, talking to you uh, today about the work that um, WGU has been doing around competencies and starting to, um, um, align those with skills, um, particularly the skills that are in demand um, um, by employers and, and the work that we're doing there to create all of those connections. Um, at the end, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the um, Open Skills Network. Um, I'm serving as the interim executive director, although it's been a year now, so interim seems like it's a long interim, um, but, um, but we'll talk to you a little bit about the, the work that we're doing um, there as well. So um, happy to be here. All right, so just a, a little bit of uh, background on uh, WGU is um, this is our 25 uh, year anniversary and we are really excited about um, you know, all of the, the work that um, we're continuing to do. Um, you know, one of the, the things that um, WGU I think was you know, really most innovative for was all of the work that we did um, around competency-based education and if you can, imagine 25 years ago when um, governors came together and they said, you know what, um, we have a workforce development issue, especially in the Western states where there's a lot of rural areas. We have large gaps in what we are needing from a job perspective and our current higher ed institutions, you know, can't fix that. We have a lot of working adults um, that are in areas that are not easy uh, to get um, to a, a, a higher ed institution for, and they're trying to balance work and families. And how do we start to recognize um, the skills that many of these working adults already have? And so um, there were two governors um, in particular, um, Mike Levitt and um, Governor Romer in um, Colorado, that kind of got together and said, we need a higher ed institution that really leverages technology. And if you think about the, call, the technology 25 years ago, this was a, a pretty forward thinking um, goal. And uh, Governor Romer, Romer was thinking like, we need an institution that really is flexible, but acknowledges and recognizes and gives credit for the skills that um, individuals already have. I, I always like to give the example of like an accounting program. Um, there was um, a woman that um, was getting her bachelor's in accounting and she had been working as a bookkeeper for you know, a large, I think, construction organization for like 15 years. And so, she, but she needed her degree to get ahead. And so having her go through an accounting program at the same pace as someone like me would have been probably excruciating for her and I probably would have been lost. And so like, how do we really start to recognize that um, individuals are coming in with um, different levels of experience, especially as we're thinking about um, working adults. Um, how do we recognize that um, individuals are coming in with different needs around flexibility for pace, you know, depending if they're, you know, juggling family and jobs and so forth. Um, and, and how do we really start to um, personalize that um, for students? And so um, 25 years ago, the, the 19 governors um, as part of the Western Governors Association um, came together and said, you know, we need to, we need to solve this, um, you know, for the future of, of the workforce. And so that's um, really how um, WG you sort of came about and it was it was not easy um, there was obviously a lot of skeptics um, there was a lot of organizations that didn't think that this was um, possible um, but um, you know here we are and we've got over 130,000 actively enrolled students um, I know we have over 250,000 graduates and so it's it's a pretty great success story 
So one of the things that um, we were really kind of thinking about, and, and Casey's going to talk a little bit more about this, is that you know, we're continuing to kind of think about like the future of higher ed. And I think, you know, WGU with being innovative in the competency-based education space, I think is, is a great example of that. But one of the things that, um, you know, has always been at the heart of WGU is really identifying um, the programs that are going to meet um, workforce needs. And so, um, and, you know, since that was really like the, the reason why WG was founded, and that's been pretty consistent in the programs that we offer today. Um, WGU, we offer programs in IT, business, healthcare, and teaching. And these are all degrees that, you know, we can say are big needs in, in the different communities. And so um, our programs have always been about uh, making sure that there is that alignment um, between what um, students will be learning and mastering as part of their degree programs and what the needs of the, the workforce are today. And so um, Casey is going to talk a little bit about sort of how that evolves and where we are taking that um, as a university and then even more broadly um, um, in the next few slides. So Casey, why don't you say a little bit more about what we're doing at WGU? You bet. Thanks, Sarah. So building on what Sarah just talked about, um, at WGU, we have always been competency-based. That was our focus from the beginning, that is our focus now. And we have, in the recent years, about the last three, um, really doubled down on our commitment to our learners as a competency-based ed uh, education institution to be hyper-aligned with the workforce. And that means starting to think about our programs and what it is that we need to offer our students in the language that employers speak. And that language is skills. Um, we are hearing more and more that uh, employers are saying higher ed at large. You are not turning out individuals who are um, have the skills that we need to fill the high demand roles that we have. And as educators, we need to be listening to that um, and taking it to heart. And at WGU, we are. And so we set on a journey to really unpack what that means. How do we ensure, one, that we are providing our students with the high value skills that they need to be successful in the workforce? Two, we know that our students are walking away from our degree programs with these skills. However, we need to do a better job about highlighting that for them in a way that they understand the skills that they have, the skills that they are demonstrating, and the skills that they are bringing to the workforce based on their education and training that they've had. So we need to do a better job at helping our students make those connections. So the way that we started thinking about this is we really wanted skills to be the thing that underpins all of our curriculum that underpins all of the pathways that our students are taking, all of the different academic achievements that they're earning at our university. So they know not, did I not just earn a micro-credential, I earned a micro-credential and these are the skills that I had to demonstrate in order to earn that credential. Um, same thing with our degrees. What were the skills that I had to demonstrate in order to achieve that, that degree conferral? Um, again, we want our learners to be able to communicate the value of these credentials that they are earning through skills and to be able to communicate the value of a WGU credential, not just through skills, but still on a transcript and a record where we can still communicate higher ed institution to higher ed institution, higher ed institution to employers and higher ed institution to our students about the skills that they have. So we'll talk a little bit about how we did that. Uh, three years ago at WGU, we established what we refer to as the skills architecture team, uh, which I have the pleasure of leading. We are small but mighty. And we had the charge of figuring out how we evolve our competency-based model to account for the skills that our learners are earning and demonstrating and to make sure that we are building pathways with those high demand skills embedded, that those pathways are transparent about the skills that students are demonstrating and that we're helping our students see 
those skills and that we are um, ensuring that our credentials are also articulated through skills to help anyone that our learners wanna share those credentials with, be it another academic institution, be it a prospective employer. Um, so that was our charge, figure out how we do this with skills. So as we started down this journey, we really recognized that we needed to be thinking about pathways that we're building um, achievements that we're building and records um, for our students in a way that can communicate with employers, other higher ed institutions, et cetera. So with the skills architecture team in collaboration with other cross-functional groups within the university, we created what was known as the WGU achievement architecture. So what this achievement architecture is, is it's basically our processes and methods at WGU that we use to make sure that as we're building skills into our programs, as we're building achievements, as we are adding things to our students' learner record, and as we're creating skills-based achievements for them, that we're doing this in a way that uses open technical standards so that we can share that information more easily with our students, with other education institutions, with employers via our students. And so this was the evolution of achievement architecture. Let's dive a little bit more specifically into what that means and where skills fits into the equation. So as we're thinking about pathways to opportunities, we had three goals in mind. As we're exploring skills-based credentials, achievements, pathways for our students, there were three things that we decided that we wanted to accomplish as a university. One is that we wanted all of our achievements, all of our credentials that we issue to be skills denominated. Meaning if we issue a degree, if we issue a micro credential, our students understand the skills that they have demonstrated in order to earn that achievement. And anyone that they share that achievement with also understands the skills that they had to demonstrate to earn it. The second thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to make mechanisms for sharing those achievements easier for our students through what's known as the learning and employment record and an achievement wallet. So if you think of the learning and employment record as a ongoing collection of all of the students' learning experiences, employment experiences, educational credentials, we wanted to be able to have our students take the achievements that we are giving them at WGU, they are earning at WGU, and surface those to an achievement wallet that they own, that they can share, that they can select what achievements they want to pull in and showcase depending on the kind of story that they're trying to tell. If they are wanting to showcase their own unique talent brand with a prospective employer, that they can do that. If they're wanting to share specific information about themselves and their learning history with another education institution, that they can do that. So we wanted to build this achievement wallet where a student can really showcase what they have learned, what they have earned, and what they have demonstrated across their learning pathways. And then the last thing that we wanted to be able to do was to create um, more flexible pathways for students where those pathways to their goal are more transparent and that we could provide them better information about what we call, we wanted to be able to, uh, what we call compass them, to guide them, to provide them better insights into different pathways. So those pathways could be educational pathways. If I have these particular credentials, that I see in my achievement wallet. And I know that I would like to go from this micro credential to a bachelor's degree. What does that look like? And what are the pathways and learning opportunities that are available to me to help me get there? Also, if I have a particular career in mind, if I right now am working as a CNA, I'm exploring education opportunities at WGU and I know my ultimate goal is to become a nurse, what are the skills that I need to develop? What are the skills that are in high demand for nurses? What are job opportunities for nurses that are local to me? What exists job-wise within my zip code? These are all kinds of information that we wanted to be able to surface to our students through the functionality of 
their achievement wallet. So in order to do that, there's some technical stuff <laughs> that we had to pay attention to along the way so that we could make sure that what we were building was not only useful to our students within WGU, but external to us. We needed to architect what it was that we were creating on an open infrastructure. So this visual that you see here is what we refer to as the diamond of interoperability at WGU. It means that in the areas of open skills, open records, open achievements, and open pathways, we wanted to leverage open existing data standards to build any of our technology solutions for our students in these areas using those open standards so that we weren't creating something that was only valuable within the walls of WGU, but that it could be used, it could be understood, and it could be accepted beyond our borders by both employers, as well as other um, education institutions and any learner worker in the United States. So as we started architecting um, this infrastructure, we saw that there are plenty of open standards in the open records space. There are also existing standards in the open achievement space. So for example, all of our achievements that we issue at WGU, we author in the open badge standard so that it can be ingested by multiple systems. Open records, um, we use both the case standard as well as standards through PESC uh, to make sure that we have the ability to share records to the learning and employment record um, as well as standard academic transfer. We use uh, open pathways from uh, Credential Engine CTDL specification. So all of these were filled, but the one area that was lacking was open skills. There was no existing data standard or specification for how we would communicate about skills with other organizations with our students. And so this piece, as we started really focusing in here, sent us on a bit of a journey. And I'm gonna to talk to you about what that journey looked like. So as we started exploring skills and knowing that we wanted all of our achievements to be skills denominated, we wanted our students to be able to understand the skills that underlie their program, and that we wanted to be able to provide both career and education pathway information to our students, we really had to start digging in at this level. So where we started was we took all of our competencies and we worked with our labor market employment partner, Burning Glass MZ. At the time, it was Burning Glass and MZ. They've since merged together um, to help us understand what skills might be in our programs. And so we sent them all of our competencies. They sent us back their information. And what became very clear very, very quickly is the best proxy that we have right now for understanding the skills that are in competencies, the skills that employers are looking for are keywords. So what we got back from this effort was a massive data set of thousands of keywords that uh, AI had scraped from job posting, scraped from the internet, which is helpful in one sense. It gives us some signals and some direction as to the skills that employers might be looking for and the skills that might be in our programs. But in those key words, we realized very quickly that context was everything and lacking. And so we had some work to do. For example, we saw that communication was a key skill that was required and requested across nearly every sector it was flagged as being included in nearly every program that we had at WGU. But we know what communication looks like for a software engineer versus a nurse versus an air traffic controller are very different in application. And it's that context that makes more meaning for our students, that gives us something more actionable as we're developing programs to make sure we're really including what a student needs for their particular careers. And it's ultimately more meaning for our students to be able to talk about the skills that they have. So we rolled up our sleeves at WGU and we started on a mission to get that context. We uh, talked to hiring managers, employers in different sector areas that we had related to our programming. And those conversations looked something like this. 
when you say you need good communication skills for a software engineer, what does that mean? What are they communicating about? Who are they communicating with? What are the tools that they're using to communicate? And would hear things back like, well, our software engineers need to be able to explain code changes to other software engineers, but they also need to be able to describe those code changes to non-technical stakeholders. For nurses, they need to be able to communicate patient status, not only to the shift change nurse, but they need to be able to communicate it to the patient. And so this is the kind of information that we started collecting as we go, this rich statement that contextualized the skill for the particular job application um, or career that we want to focus it in on. As we started collecting this information, we started realizing the power of what it was that we were creating in building an open standard or an open syntax around skills. We started to see this come, it started to crystallize for us. So if we took the keywords that you can source from labor market data, if we add to that the skill statement about what that skill looks like as, as applied for particular job roles, other occupational data like what are the specific job roles that need this particular skill applied in this particular way. So specifically, I'm talking about the Bureau of Labor Statistics and ONET's job codes that we could associate with this information as well. Any industry standards, academic standards, or existing industry certifications that might exist where this skill is important, as well as other um, connections to real-time labor market insights. What kind of information could we provide to our students if we were to link all of this information together with linkage to the MZ Open Skills Library? All of a sudden, we had this very powerful data package um, that at the time we were housing in a very robust spreadsheet. And we started talking with other organizations about this kind of data and learned a couple of things. One, they were hungry for it too. Two, they were having the same problem accessing it. And three, if they were trying to collect the same kind of information, they didn't have a really great way to do it either. So as we were talking with other organizations, we realized we're not the only ones with this problem. We're not the only ones trying to solve um, this issue. And that in order to do it, we needed to start pulling together as a collective. So that's exactly what we did. And it was the beginning of the Open Skills Network story that Sarah will talk to you in just a moment. Um, but to close the loop on our WGU use case, I wanna talk to you a little bit about then this powerful little data package that we built, which became known as the Rich Skills Descriptor and was the open data syntax that we use to round out or to point out the four points of the diamond of interoperability. So with the RSD, um, we now had a full diamond of interoperability where we could bring the three goals that we had for surfacing information to our learners to light. So as we started collecting these RSDs in our massive spreadsheet, um, there were a couple of things that happened simultaneously. One, WGU knew, now had rich skills descriptors that we could then align to our existing programs. So we had that rich context that we were lacking in the beginning. And we also had information about the careers that those skills were applicable to that now allowed us to associate RSDs with the academic achievements that we were issuing to our students, showcase those skills to our students as they were able to pull those achievements into an achievement wallet, and with the linkage to the employment information and job alignment within the RSD, now we can also compass our students to career opportunities, as well as educational pathways within WGU that are going to help them build the skills that they need for a particular career. So as our use case at WGU was unfolding and coming to fruition because of this skills information, so started to build um, a coalition 
uh, that Sarah will talk to you about in just a moment. And one of the early developments from WGU and this coalition was to, as, as I put it, get us out of the spreadsheets, get us a better way to manage this kind of data set where um, it's easier to understand. It's got a prettier user interface because that's important. But so is the ability to share this information so that we're not going through this heavy lift and doing it alone and the only ones that can benefit from it. There is extreme power and utility in having skills data like this open so that other organizational institutions can leverage it, so that other employers can leverage it, so that we can start moving towards a skills-based education and hiring ecosystem that that impacts every learner worker in the United States. So to do that, we started developing the Open Skills Management Tool. This is a tool that allows users to create libraries and collections of rich skills descriptors, to do it in a way where that data is structured and open and linked. So every RSD that is authored through the open skills management tool has a unique URL that can be addressed and located on the open web. And the Osmet tool, Osmet is what we call it, the open skills management tool, it allows for organizations to create those libraries, um, edit those libraries, and most importantly, share those libraries. So if I go back in time, had something like this existed as WG was starting on their skills journey, it would have decreased the lift for us by many dollars, many hours, and many months of work. So the open skills management tool um, is free, open source for any organization to use. It has been in um, what I would call a, a beta state over the last couple of months um, and is getting ready to release open um, to anyone for use in just a couple of days. Yeah, so, on Monday. On Monday. Yeah, so this is a tool that everyone will benefit from. Um, WGU is also, uh, by the middle of February, starting to release our own skills library that we have built. Over 13,000 rich skills descriptors that we will be releasing and publishing through the open skills management tool for any other organization to use to partner with us on to help us make better. Um, our first group of these collections will be published out mid February with other rolling releases every quarter until our entire library is published and available for the world to use so i'm going to turn it over to Sarah now to talk a little bit about the. Um, extreme excitement and energy and collaborative that has built around this work and talk to you about the Open Skills Network. All right, thank you, Casey. And thank you, Susie, for um, posting the link uh, to um, OSN and the um, Open Skills Management tool in the chat. Thank you for doing that. Um, so as Casey was mentioning, right, this was, this was work that WG was doing um, in an effort to kind of really say, are our programs truly aligned to what employers are needing? And so through these conversations with other organizations and kind of seeing this gap between the skills that we could get from these third, third party labor market insight providers like an MC Burning Glass and what was truly actionable was a big gap, we started to have more conversations and starting to really think about you know, to change that intersection of education and employment hiring practices, you know, we need to come together as a large coalition to solve this together. Um, we know, um, and I know you know, all know, that organizations are having to become increasingly resilient in uh, this change that we're going through. Um, and we need to become increasingly equitable um, in this change that we're going through. So really leveraging um, the Open Skills Network is that coalition of different organizations that can start to use skills 
um, as that underlying currency of value that we can start to connect between employers and education providers and truly to benefit individuals and allowing them to get better jobs, allowing them to see what their career advancement um, opportunities are. And so through this, um, this mission, um, we have a lot of organizations that are, are working on this um, together. So Casey, if you want to Thank you. Um, so this should be no surprise, right? These are things that we're seeing um, all, every day um, in, um, in the news, in different publications, about um, issues that we're seeing um, around skills, as well as the, the movement around skills. I, I confessed to, to Casey right before this meeting that I've got like 60 tabs open in my um, in my. Uh, Google or in, in Chrome, all around these articles that are coming out daily about the shift towards skills and this need towards skills and really thinking about this as a way to improve um, equity and inclusion. So uh, things that we're seeing in the news are, and this I know is probably not surprising to any of you, is that employers are really rethinking whether or not the degree is that um, bar for entry into a lot of their different job roles. Um, I, th I think only a third of, um, of individuals in the US, have a, of adults in the US have a degree, and that is a significant barrier, especially for underserved and overlooked populations, of which many have the experience and the skill set um, to do those jobs, but they're being filtered out uh, through applicant tracking systems and through recruiting methods on whether or not they have that degree. And as we're starting to see employers really struggling to find talent, you know, really rethinking, um, you know, what is it that they're looking for? And, you know, starting to see um, that they're rethinking the, the degree as a requirement or they're augmenting the degree with um, the skills that underlie those. And so starting to kind of tease those things out. Um, employers are wanting verified skills. Um, so looking for education providers that are actually doing the validation work um, to say that, yes, we have validated and verified that these individuals have these skills. Um, we're all hearing about um, the need for upskilling, reskilling, cross-skilling, I think was the latest uh, term that I heard, you know, continue to, to meet the demands of the workforce. Um, I read this um, <clears throat> really interesting article, I think it was in uh, Dismissed by Degrees, which was a, an article that came out by HBR, um, uh, that was talking about um, that, you know, as we start to automate, like, so it's a really interesting dynamic, and, and this might not be news to you, but I, I, it was like a light bulb moment for me. But as, you know, employers are having a hard time finding individuals to do the skills, they're increasingly moving towards automation and automating and saying, okay, we can't find humans to do this, let's automate that. But in the, the act of automating that, they have now raised the bar for the skills that they need because now they need individuals that can work with like the automation technology. So it's kind of this really rough cycle of, you know, continuing to weed out people that are really having the skills that can do this job, but then kind of having this cycle of continuing to raise the bar in terms of expectations around the skills that we're needing. And so um, there's a lot of really interesting, um, you know, research and, and articles about that and, and how um, really kind of figuring out um, the skills piece to make stronger connections is, is, um, is what we're what we're really needing to kind of drive things forward. So the other piece to this, right, is that you know there are gaps, right? There are perceived gaps and real gaps between what individuals have and what employers are looking for. And real is that you know we're continuing to raise the bar on skills that are needed. Jobs are continuously changing. But the other piece to this is that individuals do not understand the skills that they have. If you think about um, individuals that start to, um, you know, that are in a math class in college, they're like, well, what did you learn? I learned math. You're like, okay, 
you learned math, but you also learned how to communicate uh, with data. You learned problem solving. You learned critical thinking. You, there is a whole host of skills that you learned as part of your math class. And typically, those are the skills that you are going to see on job descriptions and that employers are looking for. But students don't think like that. They don't think about those underlying skills that they have. Individuals have more marketable skills than they realize. They just don't see it and they don't understand how to communicate it. And that continues to lead towards this gap. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're doing as part of um, this OSN work, I think as Casey mentioned, is starting to build up this infrastructure of open skills and really starting to connect these pieces so that learners can understand the skills that they have. They can talk about those with employers. Employers can communicate the skills that they're looking for, which not only helps those individuals, but it helps um, educational organizations to make sure that we are creating programs that meet the needs of individuals and, and workforce. And so starting to really build these together. So one of the, the fantastic things about um, OSN is that there is a, a collective understanding that this you know, is something that we're gonna need to solve for for the future of work. Uh, we have a fantastic um, coalition of organizations that have joined us in this work, um, whether that is education providers, employers, military associations, workforce development initiatives, government, um, and, and more to really start to think through this work and think through, as Casey mentioned too, all of those pieces of interconnection and how do we not just have this database of amazing skills, but how do we start to use this um, in education and employment um, settings? And how do we start to connect all of these dots? And so right now, um, the Open Skills Network has over um, 1,700 members. Um, we have over 750 uh, member organizations. And um, this organization just started in September of 2020. So in a pandemic, no less, uh, we were able to, to pull together um, this amazing coalition of like-minded organizations that are really here to kind of solve that need. So, um, so some of the goals that we have around OSN is starting to kind of put those pieces together. How do we start to accelerate the adoption of that skills-based education and hiring? And I know, and, I've, and I, I'm also um, responsible for our gen ed um, course instructor team at WGU. And, and what I hear frequently is, well, what about, what about degrees? Like, are we not saying that those are important? And we're like, no, those are absolutely important. But what individuals and organizations need to know are what are all the skills that are part of that degree package? And how do you start to pull those out? So that way individuals can tell their story about the skills that they have. And I think even more importantly, achieving along the way, right? Right now, you've got a four-ish year bachelor's degree, as an example. And at the end of that, you get this like really amazing, you know, credential, but you have been learning skills all along that path to that four-year degree. So let's start to kind of pull that out and make that more transparent so individuals can start to leverage those before their four years are over? How can they start to talk about those and think about those and utilize those in a way that they're gonna be able to capitalize that and start to move on that career path and get those jobs because they do have those skills. It's not, you know, at the end of their degree program, all of a sudden they're magically bestowed with all of these skills. They are learning them along the way. So how do we make sure that students understand that and can communicate that and they understand the value of that. And so really thinking about that intersection of skills-based education and hiring with the goal of enabling um, individuals to really kind of see those connections and to leverage those um, in the most effective way. Um, as Casey mentioned, um, a lot of the, the work we've also been doing with the Open Skills Network is reducing those technology barriers. Um, how do we get people out of spreadsheets and how do we start to um, put tools out there that will help support this adoption as well. Um, I think if that was the path, if it's like, hey, here's your 13,000 skills, you know, create a spreadsheet, like no one would do this work. I mean, WGU did this because 
I mean, no one else was doing it. And so, um, but we know that that's not a, that's not a scalable solution. So putting out solutions that other organizations can adopt is a critical piece to this. Um, the other piece that I'll, I'll mention is that, um, you know, Casey talked about, um, you know, that our um, open skills management tool is, is doing a formal launch on Monday. And in the next couple of weeks, um, WGU is starting to release um, some of their library collections, you know, as, as part of that. And other organizations are, are going to do the same, um, also start to release um, their, their library collections of skills as well. And this, this movement is not for us all to say, yes, this is the definition of communication in health professions that we all agree with. That's not the, that's not the goal. It's not the goal to you know, come up with a single definition for every skill. What the goal is, is to actually be able to make transparent how organizations are thinking about those skills in terms of what they're producing in their graduates and what they're asking for for employers. And so we do anticipate that there will be many libraries on things like cybersecurity. Um, but ideally, what people will start to do is instead of saying, hey, I need to understand you know, our skills that we've got in cybersecurity, let me, let me create my own list. Start with the open skills network. Start with the libraries that are already there and say, wow, you know what? This library, you know, that was developed by whatever organization really matches what we're trying to do as an educational institution. Let's adopt this particular library or this particular collection of skills. Or you could say, you know what, this gives us a starting point. This gets us 80% there. So let's start with this collection. And then we can add on to it things that might be specific to our organizational needs. And ideally, what we'll start to see over time is that you know through the different collections let's say of cybersecurity we'll start to see that more that's you know there might be a handful of libraries that get leveraged more often than others and so how do we start to raise the visibility of that um, in terms of you know becoming some sort of standard maybe but definitely not the the requirement so how do we start to kind of build this community as you think about it it's kind of creating like the internet of skills right and you can think about it like with google searches right you can search for things and there's going to be things that are more popular that you know show up first so how do we start to leverage all of these different collections and all of these different use cases to be able to really support um, all of the different organizations that we're anticipating to, to use this work. Um, so um, some of the things that uh, we've um, sort of accomplished to date, as I mentioned, um, this um, organization started in September of um, uh, 2020. Um, and already I, I just had um, um, a meeting with our um, I guess our board um, or steering committee for OSN just this week. So I know these numbers have been updated, um, but we have uh, more than 750 um, employer and educational and organizational providers as part of our um, network. We have over 1700 um, members and it's interesting too, and, and maybe this isn't a surprise to, to you, but there are other countries that are much further along in this work um, than we are here in the US. Um, Australia is doing some fascinating work um, in this space and um, they're actually um, a really um, great um, collaborator in this space and uh, very engaged in this work. Um, Canada um, has also done some great work around skills and credentialing. Um, the EU, um, Singapore, um, lots of organizations in other countries, you know, uh, I think that, you know, might have a little bit more like kind of, you know, um, organization to kind of, you know, go behind them from like a national perspective, but um, we are seeing a lot of international interest um, in this work as well. Um, so we do have uh, work groups um, right now that are part of um, the Open Skills Network, everything from, you know, governance in terms of, you know, how do we continue to, to you know, work as an organization, um, you know, organizations that are really focused, or work groups that are focused on the technology aspects of, you know, tools like Osmit, 
Um, another work group thinking through um, policy and you know what kinds of things do we need to be thinking about from a policy perspective, as well as how does this fit into open recognition and some of the badging standards um, that we're seeing as well. Um, we have created um, several different um, pilots and collaborative projects that we are hosting and supporting, um, you know, as part of doing um, this work as well. So thank you, Casey. Um, so some of the things that we're trying to do is, um, you know, it's still early days and there's still a lot of work to do. As, as you know, we mentioned, the, the tool set to really help support this work is, um, you know, just formally launching on Monday. Um, some of our first libraries are going to start to be released, um, not just from WGU, but hopefully from others um, starting this month, where we can actually have, you know, something in there for um, organizations that are interested in joining, um, be able to, to use. And so how do we start to create these libraries and how do we make sure that they are published for open use? Um, how do we start to create these use cases? So, okay, great, we just launched this library. Like, so what? Like, what do I do with it now? Like, what does this mean? And so start to kind of really make sure that we are um, reinforcing the value. Like, how should this be used? How could this be used? And really starting to work with our community partners on other opportunities to leverage this data in ways that we haven't thought about. Um, we know that organizations are frequently using um, skills and skills language in their job descriptions. You know, can um, different entities start to leverage this, um, this skills language, you know, and how they're creating job descriptions? Can we partner with organizations that are focused on hiring to help inform their applicant tracking systems? Can we work with educational institutions to kind of help inform their design practices? Again, with all of this being rooted in skills that um, employers in the workforce are needing for the current um, for their current needs as well as the future of, of work. So really thinking through like those um, best practices and, and how to best um, leverage the libraries, um, the tool sets, and also importantly, um, those connections between it. Um, you know, one of the, the, the slides that we didn't include in here, and, and Casey is, is definitely more of the expert, is being able to connect this skills infrastructure to learner achievements and being able to kind of connect the dots between what employers are looking for and how students go through different um, educational opportunities and then how those skills that they're achieving as part of those programs then get displayed to individuals who can then start to curate that picture and that narrative for themselves. Um, if I'm an employee and I'm you know applying to, you know, employer A for a position, I might show this set of skills that I've earned that have been validated. But if I'm applying for a different role with a different organization, I might curate that differently. And so how do we make sure that students understand that, um, that individuals understand how they can kind of create that value to curate their own story, their own narrative, all with um, validated skills um, behind them. So um, we've done some great work with um, Indiana um, on some use cases of how all of those pieces in the diamonds um, that Casey mentioned um, kind of fit together and not just in a, in a research like, hey, wouldn't it be neat if, but an actual um, solution that is um, in use today. Um, I think it's around, uh, is it medical assistant or medical coding, Casey? Medical assisting. Thank you. Medical assisting, you know, as a start um, in uh, the state of Indiana. So doing some really interesting um, work there. So, um, so that I think is our last slide. Um, so um, thanks again for, for posting, Susie. Um, so here you can see the link for the Open Skills Network. Um, there's a lot of resources um, on that uh, website. Uh, we do have uh, webinars. Um, that we uh, conduct every month. Um, those are all um, curated on a, a YouTube channel, as well as uh, you know different information um, about uh, tool sets that are being released, libraries that are um, going to be released. Um, just as a an example, which I think we're really excited about, um, you know, from the going back to the WGU use case, is that you know some of the our early libraries that we're going to be releasing are things around diversity, equity, and inclusion skills. 
So what is it that students really need to do and to know uh, to be good global and corporate citizens? And so what are those skill sets? So we have created um, an initial library and um, I think as we start to release um, these libraries, starting to pull in um, organizations and institutions that want to partner with WGU to say, okay, this is, this is great, right? This is our draft one. Um, and how do we start to pull together a coalition of like-minded institutions to help us continue to um, you know, refine and improve upon and knowing that these are not static, right? Um, these are skills and libraries that will continue to change over time. So building up um, organizations and different coalitions to help us refine our libraries around you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, social emotional learning um, is another one that I think will be um, really fascinating, as well as you know, some domain specific um, examples like medical assistance or curriculum instruction or business ethics. Um, so starting to kind of release um, those libraries and starting to, to pull together organizations for refinement. Um, so a lot of um, great, exciting work um, that we've got coming up in the future too. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, we're really excited about, um, you know, the, the work that we've got going on and we're always looking for partners. Um, so if there's any interest, um, you know, please check out the Open Skills Network um, site and get involved. Sounds good. So yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the inspiration. Thank you very much for the, gosh, encouragement. If, if oh. I, I, I just have too many questions to, 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 to list at this point, but if you, if you don't mind, we, 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 would you please take a few questions? Absolutely. We do have uh, I Amber, I think, has yep. been uh, right, uh, taking, taking notes. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that was, you know, to start us off, that would be my question. How do we contribute? How do we, how do we link to you, basically? So uh, you, I, I believe you, you have already answered it. Sorry, let's go to the website. There is, there is uh, lots of information there. There is the email address I posted also the, the, for the Open Skills Network. And I'm, I'm really receiving a steady flow of emails from you. So I'm very happy to, to be in the know, so to speak. So Amber, please take it away. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah and Casey, for your presentation. That was really great. I think in the chat, there's some excitement around um, the network, right, that's launching. And again, thank you for that work. I have a couple of questions for you. I'm a faculty member at Compton College in Southern California. So I have a couple of questions from the faculty perspective, if I can indulge myself. Yeah, please. <laughs> so, so I think about, you know, like this amazing network and when you were talking about the development of your uh, your descriptors, the first thing I thought of was this just a cataloging of existing curriculum that you already had, or did you realize that there might be a need to adjust some of the curriculum for that? So I don't know if maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what that process was like internally, maybe facing faculty and what challenges you might have had at that time. Yeah, Casey, do you want to start with that one? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so it was a combination of both. Um, what we saw was that in some cases, the skills that were sought by employers and the skills that were actually taught in our curriculum, there was a, a match. But we also saw that in some cases there was a gap. So um, a, a great example of that was I don't think we recognized um how significant for a lot of our business college learners that sales was going to be and so thinking about what could that look like and how could we touch on something like that more meaningfully within our curriculum so the way that this looked for us at wgu was we worked with our employer partners to help fill gaps that we had in terms of the skills um, to validate some of the existing statements that we could just draw right from our competencies because you know we are aligned with the workforce so a lot of what we needed was there but the piece where we had like those employers hiring managers to help fill in those gaps to create a really truly um a library of skills focused on the, what the workforce is saying they need it was a, a nice collaboration and then we worked very closely with faculty at that point to say, OK, here are the skills that we are hearing from from employers that they need. Let's look at the curriculum together. Where are these covered? Like because they're there, 
in many cases. We just have to unpack it and talk about it in a different way to our students. So our faculty were big contributors in helping us, um, I guess I'd say tag our existing curriculum with these skills, with these rich skills descriptors so that we could align it to every competency, every assessment, every academic credential. So they were major partners with us in that work. And I will just take this opportunity to say too, um, any step in a skills-based direction is the right step. So if the way this looks is not at the scale of what WGU has done, and if it looks like a single faculty member looking at their syllabus and helping students understand employment relevant skills that they are learning and demonstrating within that course, that is a win. Um, and Casey, and I'll, the one thing I'll add to that too, and, and I think maybe it's just because I've got, um, you know, the, the gen ed um, curriculum, like in, in my organization is, is that like, that's a gold mine of skills um, that are really what employers are, are looking for. Um, if you look at job descriptions, you know, the skills that you see in there, I would say are overwhelmingly um, skills that students are learning in gen ed. They just don't see that and they don't understand that. But that is so critical, I think, for, I mean, at WGU, we don't want any student to say, like, I don't understand why I have to take this course. This does not apply to me. I don't understand why I have to take this. I mean, we should be able to make it very clear in terms of, you know, why this is important. How are they going to leverage this on this job? Like, how do they communicate what they're learning and the skills that they're achieving, you know, to employers and make those connections um, much more relevant? And, and I think, um, Amber, to your question, right? That's a that's a really key role that um, instructors um, can do as well and can do today, right? Um, is to really make those connection points much more clear so students can see that relevancy and they can understand that value and be able to communicate that with current and potential employers. No, that's great. Thank you for, for asking that. And, you know, when I hear you guys talk about this, I also think about, about that student perspective. Right, so in the California Community Colleges, we have our guided pathways. And one of those, those pillars, right, of our guided pathways is ensuring learning. And that is one of the places where I think some colleges struggle, right? So are students really getting what we think they should be getting out of our courses? So, you know, I guess another question I might have is, is there a tool that you use at WGU to kind of um, to kind of close that gap on ensuring learning, right? Do you, you know, what kind of the conversations might you have with students or your student government, um, you know, or just even, you know, assessment methods that you might use to ensure that students are, are getting the things that you're hoping, right, or that we're really striving for them to get out of the class? So how we've built this into to WGU is, I mean, we're fortunate in that we're a competency-based um, institution. So every competency that is part of a degree program or any credential program is assessed and validated and it needs to be demonstrated before students can move on. And so what we've then done is sort of taken our competency-based model and started to actually identify what those underlying skills are. Uh, so we do see skills as that fundamental like atomic unit, that building block, you know, to the competencies. Um, but all of our competencies, you know, are assessed and, and validated um, through WGU. So it, it's already built into, into our model. Um, but I think that, you know, if I, if it wasn't a competency-based institution, right, I think a lot of that is just in the assessments that are created within any course, right? So understand, like, what are not just, like, the goals of the course, but what are you hoping, you know, students can actually do with that? You know, what kind of skills are you expecting them to have and to be able to build that into any assessment program? Um, I think one of the, the interesting things about this as well, and there was a a uh, really great uh, webinar um, that we just had uh, this month around uh, 21st century skills and uh, the work that Education Design Lab is doing in that space. Um, and also, you know, realizing that there is a huge need for being able to assess those skills that are harder to assess. So they're doing some really great work with organizations like Muzzy Lane to kind of build that out as well. 
Thank you so much. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I know that there was a question in the chat and I think it was re-answered. So folks were wondering if there was a fee to join OSN, but I understand there's no fee, right? Nope. So Casey is inviting everyone to join, to come take a peek, <laughs> to come and participate and see how you might be able to apply those things to your own courses or your own programs. Yeah, and I think that's one of the keys about, you know, the Open Skills Network is we're really emphasizing open. Uh, we really want this to be a movement. Uh, we really want to empower organizations to be able to leverage this information um, to really improve uh, the lives of, of students and to help, you know, meet those, those employer demands. So thank you for having us. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to the host because I know that we have another presentation, so I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to take up too much more time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amber. Sarah, Casey, always a pleasure. We really, I'm, I'm just so very grateful for sharing of your expertise. And again, putting this perspective for us that there is world out there, right? We are kind of like, you know, uh, in this bubble of our own system. And we know, we think we know what we are talking about. We think we know what we are doing. So it's always so refreshing to hear the outside perspective and, and especially the Western governors. Uh, experience and and the opportunities that 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 exist here with Open Skills Network. I think this is really sky's the limit. There's there's just so much work that could be done, and and I tell you, it's it's just I think or others have already expressed that it just sounds very 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 exciting, very uplifting. It it really gives us a uh, good reason to exist. These are you know despite everything that happens, I I I think this is these are these are all steps in the right direction for for higher ed. Really appreciate this. Thank you so much for your time and, and again for, for, for sharing. We'll we'll certainly stay in touch for, for future events. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, sounds good then. And good morning then again. Uh moving on the next on the I, I was thinking about the two-minute break, but I think that we, you know, this is a Zoom event. So I hope that if we need to, we can uh you know go and uh fill our cups of coffee. We'll we'll go ahead and uh move on with the uh, academic senate uh discussion and and uh again i'm just so very grateful for for state academic senate to to to, to support the all this work that we've been doing with the symposium with the friday slo talks uh, uh many people from academic senate have have stopped by and presented for us and, and attended a number of the events so again i'm just i'm just so very grateful uh considering what uh dr low just just shared with us earlier this morning about the direction for our system in uh, with, with competency-based education. And now we heard from Western Governors and Open Skills Network. Uh, please do take it away. We are all ears. Uh, uh, Cheryl, Randy, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please let us know, what, what do we do now? Good morning. Thank you, Yark. And, and again, good morning, everybody. Um, it was Really, my name is Cheryl Aschenbeck. I'm secretary of the Academic Senate. I'm also an English professor at Lassen College in far northeastern California. And um, Aaron, Randy, you want to introduce yourselves and then we'll roll? Sure. My name is Aaron Thomas. I'm a business faculty member at Coastline College, and I'm the faculty lead of our uh, direct assessments uh, competency-based education initiative. We're focused on a two-year management degree in associative science. Thank you. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. I'm Randy Beach. I am English faculty at Southwestern College. I'm also the curriculum chair there, uh, faculty co-lead on the CBE project. Uh, our program is automotive technology. Uh, and I'm also an academic member on the ACCJC commission. So and forgive the hat. It's casual Saturday, <laughs> hair day, bad hair day always. No worries. I also want to acknowledge that we have a moderator technically for this session, although we barged right in. So Bethany, thank you. And um, throughout, please ask your questions in the chat or use the Q&A. I think we're all able to monitor. We're not doing a presentation. We're aiming to have a conversation with each other. And then ultimately, as we go with you as well. Um, I, it was wonderful to think this morning or, or listen this morning to um, what Dr. Lowe shared about where we are with the collaborative. And, you know, she mentioned be late, but really 5C as for those that are in California, maybe unfamiliar with it, and then those that are outside of our system, uh, we call it 5C, it's the California Community College's Curriculum Committee, and it's really that state level guidance around curriculum. And we're really fortunate with our governance system that with faculty, we have a significant role in what we call our 10 plus one, which absolutely uh, includes curriculum as one of those 10 plus one academic and professional matters. And so the, the state curriculum committee as really a, um, a policy and regulation driving committee um, is largely faculty. We have eight representatives and a co-chair, a faculty co-chair, 
And then we also work alongside four chief instructional officers, VPs of instruction, uh, one of who is uh, the CIO co-chair. Um, we also have a curriculum specialist for their technical expertise. We have chief, we've added in the recent years chief student services officer because of the link really between financial aid and other aspects of student services and curriculum. And so that group really uh, took a nugget of information in 2019 uh, and kind of a little bit of a charge like, hey, explore this, this CBE as a potential addition to our system to serve students who we aren't otherwise serving well or serving at all, or that, um, and that we are seeing uh, moving towards, especially for-profit colleges, uh, when, you know, they're Californians, so let's serve them through uh, California public higher education. And um, like many of you, perhaps, CBE was a relatively foreign concept to most of us. And as a committee, we had to go through quite a bit of education um, and, and, and gain, try to gain some understanding. But as I think uh, Aaron and, and Randy will both share with us this morning, um, even at, the further you dive into it, the more questions arise. And uh, you heard Dr. Lowe say it multiple times this morning too, that um, we don't have the answers. We're figuring this out as we go. Like we're really building the automobile as we prepare to drive it and to some degrees as we drive it. So um, I, I posted earlier and I'll, I'll drop it in again, but uh, Dr. Lowe referred numerous times to the regulations and it was a really important starting point for 5C to work on and, and take those to the Board of Governors and have our Board of Governors, you know, put those into a formal regulation and they do exist now so that we have some structure uh, for the work that the system can, can undertake relative to CBE. And as we keep talking about CBE, we're going to talk specifically about direct assessment CBE. And uh, as it concerns, especially federal financial aid, uh, there are different forms of CBE that we know can dive all the way down into just specific classroom level and how I construct, you know, the things I do, let's say, in my freshman composition course. But when we're talking about direct assessment CBE, we're talking about entire programs uh, that are really structured in very different ways than what we're used to. Um, and that's really where the regulations go is, is what does that look like? as another means of uh, instructing students uh, and, and facilitating teaching and learning in the California Community College system. Uh, it's interesting that the regulations we developed, if you're familiar at all with Title V, uh, Division VI specifically is the California Community Colleges. Uh, and then within that, there's um, Chapter Three, I think it is, Curriculum and Instruction. And within that is Subchapter Six, I believe, uh, which is alternative um, methodologies or instructional methodologies. And that's where distance education regulations live. It's where work experience regulations live. Uh, it is, let me get back to that tab for my note, uh, independent study, uh, correspondence education. And so this was added, uh, direct assessment competency-based education was added as article six within that subchapter of alternative instructional methodologies. And that really aligns with the vision that 5C and, and, we, and our partners in the chancellor's office had for this being another means of reaching students in our system. Um, and so I, I don't wanna dwell for long on the regulations, but certainly happy to ask questions. I think Dr. Lowe raised um, some, some pieces and questions raised others, things around like mastery and mastery plus and what that looks like um, when we translate that into grades for that equivalent transcript. And, and we made that my question, thank you, Susie, I didn't get to it yet. Um, it's hard to talk and do more things. Uh, and, and so, you know, that uh, really went in with an equity focus, uh, as is absolutely warranted, uh, thinking about the diversity of the students and their experiences that we work with in our system, uh, and, and setting up the structure for what it looks like to submit curriculum uh, using our uh, system processes. And a lot of those are pieces that, you know, smaller uh, independent colleges may not have to deal with. Uh, but again, as California Public Ed, we have to deal with both statute or law. What's a legislator tell us to do and then establish our parameters within that and that's the regulatory framework that we work with we call title five um so that's a little bit of background and the senate's role again was to be you know one of the major players at the table with our faculty representatives in those conversations and so it's exciting to know that the regulations that um, evolved were very faculty driven uh, and the the folks involved in the work group within 5c that dove, dove deep into those regulations would hash things out and then bring things to the whole group. Uh, again, primarily faculty and, you know, spending a lot of time really thinking and asking each other questions and relying on expertise that the chancellor's office brought to us from outside the system. We really relied a lot um, on an equity consultant, on um, CBE consultants, uh, particularly one uh, from Brandman University, now UMass Global, 
um, you know, who have done some CBE and, and, and built programs and advised in building programs so could share with us what that could look like and what some of our options through that process were. Um, so I think with Dr. Lowe's background um, on this morning and then talking just that those regs have evolved or are now established and, and faculty, I think, significantly played a role in those. Uh, the vision was always to have the rollout, but knowing that it is such a new uh, form of instruction and that it really warrants um, a, a revamp of the things we do at our colleges, not just taking something into the classroom and changing how we do it. Um, the structures across our systems will need to change, including some of the policies that Dr. Lowe mentioned. Um, the collaborative was, was uh, proposed as a way to, uh, as she mentioned, you know, just bring colleges together to learn and, and figure things out together. And so really excited to have Aaron Thomas from Coastline College and Randy Beach from Southwestern both joining me. Um, yesterday in Aaron's uh, group presentation, we also had Lonnie, uh, and I'm blinking on her last name, but from Mount San Antonio College was one of the eight. Leticia weighed in from East LA College. And so, you know, we have two representatives here from that collaborative, uh, but some more of you are online and, and happy to hear your input as we go, you know, insert through the chat, because I'm not sure we can grab you. Um, but I want to also, so regulations are one big piece. Randy, you mentioned you're a commissioner with ACCJC. And so uh, a lot of times as we talked really early about what CBE looks like, you know, that the concern about accreditation pops up. Uh, because of course we all want to be accredited and, and have financial aid for our students and so you know briefly you want to share a little bit about ACCJ's position ACCJC's position on CBE and and you know what kind of things that maybe that we need to keep in mind as as we consider CBE locally sure absolutely and Cheryl thanks thanks for that uh, um I would say one thing to keep in mind, and, I, and I'm thinking of this not in terms of as a commissioner, but as a, a faculty member at a college that wants to implement CBE. The first thought, especially for the California system, uh, which is accredited by ACCJC, we also accredit colleges out in the Pacific, Hawaii colleges, et cetera. But one thing that came to my mind at the very beginning was, does this commission, which is focused on an, a bit of a niche in our, in our educational landscape, uh, we don't um, currently, uh, uh, we don't uh, accredit uh, universities. How involved has ACCJC been in competency-based education? What is its own experience? Uh, and some of the colleges that we accredit have elements of competency-based education. We have a policy on competency-based education. It is based on um, uh, CRAC, and I always forget the acronyms. Let me look at my notes. Uh, the Council of Regional Accrediting Commissions. CRAC is, is, a, is a nationwide organization, obviously. Um, we have learned a lot from what CRAC has experienced with universities throughout the other regional accreditors, the other, I believe, six regional accreditors. So the commission is ready. Uh, the commission has a policy on competency-based education. And, and of course, if you have uh, taken a look at the regs for California, uh, that ACCJC substantial change application and the process of having ACCJC recognize your competency-based education program, uh, that is something that you need to be familiar with if you haven't already, or, or if you're a faculty member or anyone at your college that's excited about this, you wanna ring that bell because uh, there are standards and that's a process that, that you must go through. Um, there is a fee involved in that as well. So in terms of the individual, how each individual college does it, uh, the ACCJC uh, recognizes the same forms of CBE that the federal regulations recognize, your direct assessment, your hybrids, uh, uh, your credit to clock hour conversion CBE programs where students may still be enrolling in courses, but they're, create, they're completing competencies, and then the, the conversion happens, uh, and then the hybrid version of, of those two. So uh, the commission is ready. The commission is well aware of both the work, the collaborative, uh, ACCJC was involved in many of the educational opportunities, the webinars. Uh, Cheryl, as 5C chair, you may remember how involved uh, the commission might have been in the development of regulations and in, in the original inception. Uh, but the commission is by no means an entity that wants to be in the way of this innovation. Uh, the commission is very committed to helping colleges complete their applications for substantial change and provide any support that that's needed. Um, uh, so just kind of standing by and waiting, waiting to, to see how uh, California and the collaborative works things out and then what the results of that are. And, and I'll finish by saying the collaborative uh, is hopeful that some of the eight colleges will actually be able to submit their substantive change uh, applications um, 
in April with the deadline coming up here in the middle of March. That's fantastic. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate that perspective. Um, and as Randy said, as the regs were being developed, like we weren't working, you know, hand in hand asking for, for ACCJ's permission, ACCJC's permission, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't proposing regulations that would potentially be in conflict um, with any policies and, and, and practices they expected. And so, you know, there was uh, some, some coordination of that for certain. Um, I think as we think about program and all of your colleges, you know, had to apply to be part of the collaborative. Uh, and now I've been doing that work about six, eight months, uh, I'd say. And um, perhaps a nuanced question here, like what, Aaron, you talked a little bit about this when we prepped the other day, but um, what conditions need to be uh, present to successfully launch? And, and I'd say, and I'd add to that, besides what conditions need to be present, what conditions might have you anticipated need to be, needing to be present when you apply, when your college applied? versus what are you finding needs to be the case now in practice as, you, as you're wading into this work? And, you know, certainly, Randy, I think this applies, you know, you both may have slightly different perspectives on it, but we'd love to hear from you both. Sure. Um, I think the first um, and most important is um, support from the top. Um, we all know that those that initiatives that we take on in higher ed and any organization, honestly, require direct support from leaders in the organization. And so having our president, who was our former vice president of instruction, be behind this initiative, listing it as one of the top three initiatives for the college um, is crucial. Um, because when he talks, people people listen. Um, the second thing I think needs that needs to happen is I know we've probably all experienced initiative fatigue, um, that when anyone in the organization is asked to take on this work that the organization takes something off their plate. And so for faculty, that means reassign time. And we're grateful for the funding. Um, I, I understand that there's money on the way finally from the chancellor's office, so that's great. Um, we're grateful for the funding that can allow faculty to set aside time to focus on this work because it's not something that can be added. Uh, we're already working you know a lot of us working very long hours and it also is a different mindset so providing the time and space to do the work separately from our work with students on a day-to-day -day basis is really important and then the last thing i i'm finding for us is faculty collaboration and the spirit of support for one another and working together um, at our college our dean has made it a priority to work with our regional consortium to obtain funding for the creation of what are called master courses. So um, for our career education programs, there, there is funding available if you pursue it to pay part-time faculty um, and full-time faculty to work collaboratively, three to four or more people creating a course together, that time spent developing the course can be compensated as non-instructional time. Um, so it's something to, if you're already doing that, then you're probably on a good path. Because once you start creating these courses and you see the quality, um, it builds on itself. So when we created our first master course and had four faculty members working on it, I took a look at our respective backgrounds and there was over 100 years of expertise that contributed to the creation of that course. And the outcome was a high quality course that we're really proud of. Uh, we're now on our fifth or sixth course and we've got four or five more planned. It's, it's just the way to do things. And once other faculty members so then I do a you know an internal presentation on how to do master coursework and and other people get interested and so you build that spirit of collaboration crucial for for success in this world I believe. Great, thank you, Aaron. And and how about you, Randy? What what might you add to that or reinforce? Oh wow, I mean, and 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 I my hats off to Aaron. Well, not today, my hats off, but my hats off to Aaron. And and I've had great conversations with Coastline about the great work they're doing and. And I was thinking along the lines this morning, so so story time with Uncle Randy here. So my husband and I, every Saturday, we, we go for our walk on the beach in San Diego. Don't hate. We're in San Diego. Don't hate us. Um, and I was thinking about this as we're walking. And I think the number one thing that needs to be there for your college is excitement. I mean, I really think that's so important. I mean, the the analogy that pops up in my head, the metaphors are like, imagine you're you're an eight-year-old at your birthday party and you've got all the gifts on the table over there because you know all that great stuff is waiting for you but you're told you can't open your gifts until you finish 
the entire Costco sheet cake somebody just dropped down in front of you, right? You've got all this cake to get through before you get to that, that what's in those exciting gifts. So that excitement alone is what you need to begin the process because there is a lot of work. There's a lot of cake to eat. Um, and approaching it as a learner, I think has been very crucial for me personally. And then helping communicate that to the team of folks we have gathered, um, uh, the cross-functional group that we've gathered to really look at this Costco cake from every potential angle and say, okay, well, how can we each, you know, take, take care of that part of the work that, that falls within our, our, our purviews. Um, so approaching it as a learner, as a learner, knowing that it, it's, it's a long haul, um, it, it's going to take you some time to get there. That's been great for us. Um, we are in an attention and we are in an attention deficit place right now in our world. Uh, higher education always is beset with shiny objects that come along and then people's attention get thrown over there. Hey, let's throw a global pandemic into the mix and then see if you can build a CVE program in the middle of all that too. So getting the attention of the higher ups, to put it that way, getting the attention of faculty, getting the attention of everyone. What I'm finding is it's not as daunting as I thought it would be because there are so many people who already know about CBE that they're looking back at me and our team and saying, why haven't we done this already? So finding those folks that working with the willing and helping uh, or, or enlisting the willing to help you generate the excitement and bring that attention to the CBE program, I think has been a part of our communication strategy. We are at a, I think we may talk about competency sets and the processes we're using for all that and um, when, when we get there, but, but that part is a tool that we're using to get the attention of faculty. You know, we're, we want to get everybody around the table and start looking at these things. And while we're talking about competencies, we're talking about the value of an associate's degree and even then more broadly, the value of education and our faculty love to talk about that. You never, you never see faculty say, oh, I don't want to talk about education. I don't want to talk about pedagogy. I don't want, that's what we want to talk about around the water cooler instead of, well, we got these new forms we have to fill out. And now we have to do all this and that. So this has been a regeneration of excitement around teaching for a lot of folks. Um, so I would really make that like your selling point, you know, really start there and say, hey, we have an opportunity to really, really change the way we teach. Thank you both. I think it's exciting to hear and, and honestly it was apparent in Aaron's uh, team's presentations yesterday um, with Lonnie and then uh, her dean and and, and or rather um, Aaron's dean and a researcher from Coastline uh, you know all we're, we're really excited in this work and, and Randy you are as well um, you know I, the Costco sheet cake goes a long way to meshing really well with Aaron saying you know it really needs to have a collaborative spirit right we can't eat that cake alone uh, nor should we um, but, you know, really talking across disciplines and across our colleges and in many different roles, because, you know, we know that as we introduce this, it, it will need to have its own structure, you know, all the way from the A&R folks who interact with a student when they first come to inquire and enroll, because that may look different uh, for CBE options than for our traditional enrollment options uh, to the faculty who are then in the classroom, perhaps in slightly different roles, right, um, as Dr. Aisha uh, or Dr. Lowe mentioned earlier. Um, Bethany, I want to invite, if you have questions uh, that pop up or you see something in the chat that we're missing, please jump in with us. Uh, we we'll want to welcome you to do that. Um, I think as we as we think about the conditions present and, and you know, creating that excitement and, and really tackling it with a, a learning mindset and, and going in as learners, I really like that perspective. Um, and and I'd, I'd add just from the conversations we've all had through this entire session, um, the whole SLO symposium that really approaching it too as uh, being okay with not having all the answers, but having that energy to figure it out, right? See, seeking some joy in, in solving things, uh, even if that initially leads to many more questions. Um, you know, again, that's a, a bit of a learner's philosophy, right? Um, when we talk about this being competency based education, we're, we're in an SLO symposium. Uh, are SLOs and competencies the same or are there differences and, and how might we rethink about uh, our, our conversations about student learning uh, and framing that by outcomes versus, you know, what you're doing right now, diving into uh, structuring curriculum around competencies? 
I have unmuted my microphone only to ask Erin if she would like to go first, because we had a talk about this yesterday, and, and this is a great conversation to have. Erin, would you like to take the lead on that? Uh, sure, and I'll preface it by saying that um, uh, internally we were starting to feel like, you know, you, you enter a project and there's a whole bunch of um, things you just don't even know that you don't know. <laughs> Um, and I feel like we're starting to round a corner of we actually we think we have identified all the things that we don't really know and that's there's some comfort in that, um, but I have to say that this space of comparing SLOs and competencies is in that space of we don't really know for sure. Um, I can give you my perspective and that is the SLO work that I've done has really been focused on measuring learning and um, I see competencies as taking that just one step farther into measuring doing measuring a behavior, measuring um, an implementation of the, the knowledge. So I think those of us that have worked on SLOs for all these years um, should take heart in knowing that we've built a foundation, I believe, with our SLO work for competency-based education and focusing on mastery of competencies. So I really believe that it just takes it one step further um, to be demonstrated. And many of us have SLOs that already describe the demonstration of learning. So that's great. Again, I really believe that strong SLOs position a, a, a program for an easier implementation of competency-based education. Great. Thank, thank you, Aaron. Jump in. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, this was a great conversation we all had as we were um, talking about today. I, I'm going to try and keep the Costco cake going here because <laughs> I think maybe it'll work. Um, to, to, to me, as a former SLO coordinator, and I was there kind of when things really started blowing up around SLOs at my school, um, it, it is difficult to communicate what outcomes are to faculty. We're doing much better at it now, but in the beginning, it was hard for, to wrap our heads around this. So we've gotten to the point where Aaron's definition about doing that makes perfect sense, and, and that fits in well with this, this comparison to what, what they are. So if we go back to that sheet cake, uh, the SLOs of that, that I would look at for that sheet cake is, um, can you demonstrate how to crack an egg? Can you demonstrate how to sift the flour? Can you demonstrate how to measure the sugar? You know, All of those things, that those discrete skills that go into uh, making that cake. The competencies around the cake, uh, can you, demonstrate, can you show, are you able to articulate the joy that a 18 foot Costco sheet cake brings to the people you make it for? Can you articulate uh, the overall process, the, the, uh, the elements that make baking a cake valuable to society? I, I'm, I'm trying to make this metaphor work, but, but, uh, but I think the point is the discrete skills, as Aaron put them out there? Yes. And then the competency is that overall bigger picture. There's still measurements of things, uh, but they're measurement of things that are a little less concrete than those individual SLOs might be, whether at the course or even a program level. I don't know, Erin, if that's taken it too far. No, I don't think it's taken it too far at all. And um, in, in a program like ours, which is a management degree, the next step might be, well, how are you collaborating with the other people in the kitchen to make that cake? You know, and so if that's a skill that employers are telling us they absolutely need to have in their employees, then we need to create the environment where that skill can be learned, because I do believe it can be taught, and then it can be assessed, that skill of collaboration, of communicativeness, et cetera. And, and you, to try and make it very concrete to the program we're working in, which is automotive tech. So you might have a, a competency of uh, the ability to diagnose an engine and discover the problem. Right. Well, there are many, many, many skills within that uh, large competency around the ability to diagnose and determine the automotive problem. And those specific skills like completing a work order or researching vehicle service information, those uh, would be more examples closer to SLOs. And that's a very specific CE that's very um, uh, hands on type work. And that takes some translation for the general education side of things, and, and I shouldn't think of them as two sides. I, it's, it's a habit I do, and I really need to stop it. But, uh, but that, uh, that, uh, that realm of the general education, uh, when you're working with a CE program, it, it is a little harder to translate for faculty the difference between competencies and SLOs, I think. 
I think, Aaron, one thing, well, and actually to, to address Enrique's question, the language of SLOs is rather unique. It is kind of a United States higher education term. And I think that really came through uh, accreditation, uh, at least in my perspective, because we were all using objectives all the time. And, and at least in my college early on, the confusion was, well, how is an SLO different than an objective? And, you know, it was really nuanced. And I think, you know, you, you're finding that to some degree with, uh, you know, competencies and outcomes. But one thing I found really interesting in your conversation yesterday, Aaron, was the, the switch from, you know, as an instructor, I expect a student to be able to do this uh, to the I statement that you really are centering students in those competencies. You want to share a little bit about that for those that, that didn't join us yesterday or didn't join sure. you? I just happened to be present. Um, sure. So as part of our homework, as we're developing these competency statements, we are changing the language and, um, you know, this we have in our statements at our college student will be able to or student can demonstrate in our slos of course uh, um i had worked to try and have that change to you um, because i i'm a business person and i think in a, the way marketers think um but what competency-based education does is changes it to an i can so when we present our competency for our management degree about relationship building some of the statements are I can establish and maintain productive relationships. Um, I can utilize relationships to facilitate relevant business activities or transaction. Um, I can express sincerity and build trust. So um, when it's I centered language, it's student centered. And I really hope that one of the benefits that um, the consequences of all of this is to shift our, our, our organizations to be across the board more student centric um, as we do this work. And um, so the I can statements is a really um, a really positive way, I think, to think about this. And I think it lets this, the learner take control and take and, and understand why they are moving through whatever competency it is, is so that they can achieve that. Thank you. I, I really like that perspective, especially as I think about what this looks like on a transcript later, that a student, you know, has all these I statements and, and really, I think has some ownership of then what it is they're learning as they're trying to accomplish those things, as well as a point of pride to say I can at the end. To me, that's really cool shift the language. Um, it also speaks to some of what um, the OSN folks talked about, you know, about those skills and students being able to communicate what those skills are. And we've heard in different venues, you know, like, that's one of the challenges of general education is there are so many skills embedded in it, but students just say, yeah, I, I, I took a history class and don't think about what they pulled out of that. If that's tied then to I can statements, you know, describe the influence of uh, historical movements and, and people on the events of today, like that's a whole different conversation. And again, some ownership and, and some realization of the worth of, of some classes, especially like general ed. Um, if I could uh, real fast, there's a question in the chat for uh, for Aaron and for Randy um, to maybe first consider which SLOs could be seen as a means and which could be seen as an ends in the context you're giving before. Um, they said they see favor seeing SLOs as a means, not an ends, but maybe that's specific to disciplines. I don't know if either of you had anything you want to add to that or. Yeah, I saw Steve's question. I, I think that's really good for in a lot of ways because I, 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 I tend to agree. I think SLOs are means, not the ends themselves. Um, SLOs, uh, when we talk about competencies and what I've learned about it, is we can talk about SLOs as both formative and summative, whereas competencies are more summative, uh, or they are summative. These are summative uh, assessments that tell us where we are at the end of this process, at the end of this experience with the student, as opposed to the SLOs, which can be used formatively along the pathway, along the journey there. So I think that's a great observation. And I think what it also does, and this is a general statement about the SLO conversation to begin with, is it gives faculty a, a kind of um, place to begin with their thinking around competencies. And that's why we don't, we, we wanna have a distinction between the two, but we also wanna have the conversation about how they work together. Uh, one, because of Steve's point exactly, formative to, to summative, but then also because it's a language our faculty now after Wow, 20 years, it's 2002, SLOs hit California. Here we are 20 years later. And, uh, and they understand that now. They understand what we're talking about with SLOs. So it gives us a framework to make the leap over to competencies. That's a great observation, Steve. Thank you. Because learning still happens, right, mm -hmm. in this mode. There's still learning and we still need formative assessments to, to facilitate that learning. 
a great point. Um, as, as we talk about then competencies, and, and I brought up general ed before, are there can, can, can we do CBE? Can we develop competencies for all disciplines? What do those conversations look like? And, and how are you approaching that um, within each of your efforts? Um, yes, I think we can, um, because when I take a look at our general education requirements, those are skills that employers still need. They need math, an, an employer, employee needs math skills, they need writing skills, they need some sense of, of their place in the world. Um, and so when we think about science, for example, it's it's important for someone who's an entry level manager to be able to to formulate a, a question if they're going to go research something um, and then follow do that research and they probably should follow the scientific method when they do that research. I do think there's great value and I do think we can contextualize um, the general education pattern coursework into just about every program. Um, I happened to be doing some work um, for our family legal situation and I encountered a, a paralegal who was incredibly smart and sweet and kind and could not convert a fraction to a, to a percentage. <laughs> so we, we need those math skills. Those um, employers are really looking for us to provide the whole employee, not just the one that can um, fix the engine, if you will. I, I'm math faculty, Erin, and that resonates very much <laughs> well I, i'm Perfect. just thankful i'm thankful google can do that because i'm an <laughs> english teacher i i know exactly where google can do that for me um uh, you know the, this uh notion of general ed and and this actually this conversation kind of kicked off for me when we started talking about guided pathways um because when we one of the conversations a very difficult conversation with faculty was this idea of students being um provided with specific general education courses that were more in the con context of their program. Um, so instead of having 75 different choices for area C, I'm speaking very California centrically right now, our, our Title V sections. And by the way, I, I sleep with a loose leaf binder of Title V under my pillow. I, 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 I'm only half exaggerating. Um, I, I'm gonna make a million dollars by creating an app on my phone for Title V one day. Um, those regulations do establish general education requirements and what those are are defined fairly, fairly clearly. And we started talking about guided pathways and then limiting or, or, or kind of uh, steering students into taking specific general ed courses based on how the, the outcomes or you could say the competencies of those courses represented in those courses aligned to their degree. There was a lot of pushback around that. And this had a lot to do with what I heard Vice Chancellor Lowe say this morning about the, the idea of exploration, right? Uh, I go to college because I want to explore and general education is where I can take that history course that told me I wanna be a history professor and I never knew it before, right? That kind of thing is not where our students wanna to be today. And, and I agree with what she said earlier about that. Um, so looking at general ed with our faculty as skills that are applicable outside of the academia, I think is a great way to start that long conversation to work what those competencies should be. Um, because then it makes it more relevant to the world around us. Uh, one of the steps that, that we've taken in building our general education competencies has been to look at Title V, um, where the general education requirements are mapped out very clearly, um, to look at uh, also our institutional student learning outcomes and even the program outcomes for our specific automotive program to ask how those broader competencies not specifically related to you know twisting a wrench on, on an engine how can we write those and then another source that we brought into our conversation was the lumina foundation's degree qualifications profile um, because what that document and that effort has done and, and folks may or may not be familiar with it most people probably are uh, it helps us kind of in a nutshell, define what it means to be educated and in what areas at what level. And the, the, the Lumina, the project is um, providing those domain statements or those statements and categories at the associates, baccalaureate and master's level, um, which works well in my mind for us because we need to validate to our transfer institutions, to our accreditation commission, to others and, and even to employers how this is going to work for them outside of the associate's degree environment. 
Um, so it's helping us make that preparation for validating our program to the Department of Education and, and others who are going to ask those kinds of questions and for whom we need to provide that validation. And so you raise a good point about the looking at the degree qualifications profile um, and even thinking like your work, your program uh, at Southwest is working on uh, automotive technology. And so there's industry expectations in that. And, and so it may be at least for the discipline or the major uh, aligning yourselves with the, the skills and competencies expected in the workforce and, and even by professional organizations like ASE, which I have no idea what that stands for, but I know it aligns with automotive at my college. Um, and Aaron, I imagine with management that you have some, some places you can go for those discipline related things. Um, but then there's also potentially um, you know, national standards or, or at least examples and guidance that have been set uh, for, for areas like general education, the degree qualifications profile being one, but, you know, even in English and history, um, national organizations have, you know, some example outcomes of, of what they want for those. So um, are your colleges drawing on some of those uh, examples and, and sources of information? Um, I'll, I'll throw in there since we just listened to uh, the, the Open Skills Network conversation, like, do you see yourself diving into uh, that database when it's available to see what's available and, and be able to pull pieces into the conversation as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, we're fortunate, as Randy's program is, to have an industry sort of standard, um, the management skill standard, uh, one of the standards that's out there, the one we selected and have contracted with is made, made by a company called OSI, and it's called the Polaris Leadership Model. And that program identified 41 competencies, and this is over decades and decades of research and working with with companies um, and the 41 competencies are everything from your entry level employee to your senior executive your c level c suite set of employees um, and the the various levels of mastery within each of those and so we we are we had a great starting point it was really in in fact the, i think that one of the main reasons we're moving as quickly as we are is we had we weren't starting from scratch. We had this basic set of competencies. The next step for us was to identify which are relevant to an entry level manager position, undergraduate, you know, lower division, uh, commute, uh, college level work, and then get that verified by our employers. So we're utilizing our advisory boards. We've expanded even beyond that to other industry experts who can help us prioritize those competencies, ver verify them, validate them. And so it makes you feel a lot more confident that we're producing something that is gonna be reasonable, uh, relevant, I should say, to the business community out there. I mean, I've already had people from our advisory board say, when, when can I start sending people there because I've got cool. people in my organization who would benefit greatly from this program. So that's that's the kind of relationship we want to have with our, our business advisors. That's cool. How about you, Randy? Oh, um, yeah. yes, yes. The, the um, competencies that we have written related to um, the automotive technology industry, ASC certification, I forget what ASC means too. And <laughs> um, I, I call AAA to change the car air freshener in my car. I mean, it, I, I know nothing about automotive technology, right? I can barely find my keys in the morning. But, but that external resource, that industry validated resource has not only been crucial for building our competencies and, and it's very important for communi communicating competencies to our students because they can see a concrete reason why this is something they have to do when they know that this is what your boss down the road will expect you to know and here is where it comes from. But also because we're building this chip, we're building, we're making that cake, our own faculty need to understand what we're doing and relying on those industry specifications, those industry standards that they have been trained in helps communicate that more clearly. Now, can we extrapolate that to general education and you know your philosophy class or your art class? I'm certain we can, but it will take the conversations uh, together to understand where those relationships are. And that contextualization of the competency statements on the, the, in the general education realm, those conversations are going to happen with faculty who teach philosophy and teach art history, but then those art history and philosophy teachers are going to talk to our automotive technology teachers. And we're going to talk about what those assessments look like, because a student pursuing an associate's in automotive technology is just not going to get quite how 
uh, you know, writing an essay on, you know, uh, Picasso's Guernica is going to help them be an automotive technology specialist. So we, we need to make the connections there and determine assessments that are going to help them see the real world applicability of what they're doing. Um, and not to mention what that's going to mean for our advisory committee, for our industry partners, Subaru, Mercedes, people that we're already talking to about our project. Um, those are going to be important as well. And I think we can um, use this as an opportunity to really broaden what we think about satisfying some of those general ed requirements. So, for example, in our um, at our college, we have a, a digital graphics program, and so locally for our local degree, an, an entry level digital graphics class meets our art requirement. And that is relevant to an employer. They would love to have an entry level supervisor who can put together a flyer, put together a web page, um, what have you. So we can contextualize. I'm very firmly convinced that we can contextualize those skills to be specific to industry needs. And that should sound very familiar to our California colleges working on guided pathways. The student success teams that we're all putting together around our fields of studies, all of this just fits right into that as well. So I'm kind of wondering as we're, we're nearing the end of this session, what are some first steps that faculty can take? So like, I, you know, we hear all this really great information. When I go back to my campus, you know, you mentioned we want to get our higher ups involved. We want to ask for some reassigned time. What are some of those first steps that when I go back, you know, on Monday, we can start working on practically? What do you think? I, I'd start with an inventory of who's excited about it, not the college. And um, you, you probably need to get a coalition, a cross-functional coalition of people who are excited. I know I was doing reading about competency-based education years before we started this initiative at Coastline. So you probably have people at your um, institution who are following this and who are interested. And then um, it becomes necessary to make it a institutional priority because that's when you can get the funding and that's when your, your research folks or your whoever works with your grants can figure out how to get the, the money that's gonna be needed because it's it's gonna take time and money. <laughs> but I would say start with that core group of folks who is really excited and then figure out how to get the work funded. I don't know what Randy thinks. No, no I totally agree. Um, and my internet might be unstable. I, I apologize, I, I'm unstable. So my internet fits. I think I would respond to that question and try, and I'm trying to make it concrete. Um, and we've heard this with the guided pathways work and any kind of initiative, if you've been involved in change management and so on, what is the why, right? We do have to ask that question, what is the why? And that's gonna change from college to college. Uh, is your college focused on equity? Uh, if so, then the conversation around CBE will focus on equity. If you're going to even begin to, to get the attention, remember that attention harvesting we're talking about, that attention division. Um, my husband works for Facebook. I know all about attention harvesting. Um, how are we going to make people see that this is valuable and related to, to the, the big picture mission of their college, but also more importantly, what they value? I know what I've seen from my teachers is not just that it's about equity, but it's about authentic teaching. It's about authentic learning. They get excited when they know that instead of teaching a class of 45 and hoping people get it, they are now working with teams of people who will help individual students show that they got it. And I think that resonates with a lot of our faculty who, you know, the faculty sometimes get frustrated. Am I really making a difference? And our faculty really value something that makes them feel like, hey, I am making a difference because I can see it in this student. Uh, and, and that's been a big part of helping us communicate our why. And, and the why for us is that we there's a whole population of, of potential learners out there that we haven't created an opportunity to enter our system. And so this is equity centric. And we're, what we're saying is we need an additional entry point into higher ed. And this provides that. And at the same time, it honors all of the skills and experiences that that learner brings into the program. So allow them to move quickly through certain parts of the program. And we're just filling the gaps. And we're doing that so that they can have a better outcome. I mean, what gets me up in the morning is knowing that if my students complete these programs, they should be getting more pay. They should be getting a better title, better benefits, and higher lifetime earnings. Um, and if I can get that to them faster, 
how that's totally exciting to me. So there's a, a question in the chat that ties into this um, from Steve and says, what happens if we bring it up at our college? And then we get these, you know, non-committal answers, these vague answers. You know, I we we have some ASCCC representation in the room, we have some ACCJC representation in the room. And I know that there's support from both of those of those entities, but you know, how do we like make those connections? How do we bring this back to our local sentence and say, look, this is important, here's why. I think one is facilitating the education. Um, a lot of the, the vagueness uh, might be related to just folks being overworked and feeling like this potentially is another initiative. And I think Aaron addressed earlier why it's not just another initiative. It really can be very embedded into uh, you know, the, the vision for each of our colleges when we're deliberate about that. Um, and, and I think Randy commented on that as well. But um, you know, just as 5C had to undergo education to really start to get on board with the potential for this, you know, there was resistance. Um, when I first started learning about CBE was about five years ago when uh, the, the first legislation came out about a fully online college for California because it was supposed to be CBE um, built. And, you know, I knew nothing at that point. It was one of the initial uh, work groups that explored what that looked like. And I was a little bit dubious until I kept learning more and found out, you know, who does this serve? They're not the students who are in my classroom. They're students who can't get into my classroom for various reasons. And so how exciting can that be? to you know, take education into parts of California, people of California that otherwise don't feel that they are able to access it or really just aren't. Um, and, and so that education, I think better understanding and one of the difficult parts of CB is totally different. Um, it, it's a new model of education, it, but as, as to, to make the point or to, to go back up into the chat to the point like in, include part-time faculty, you know, and, and just, Part of that education can be pulling in folks, you know, increasingly we're going to have employees who went through places and, and earned their education through WGU, through Southern New Hampshire, through UMass Global, through AS um, online, ASU online, and, and these places that, you know, were the early adopters of it. Like what great folks to include in our conversations uh, so we can only, so we can find out a little bit more about what it looks like in operation and implementation, but also so that we can perfect those models that are out there. Um, and, and so that education piece, I think, is really key. And that's where, you know, the collaborative is going to build us an additional group of, of folks uh, in many parts of a college, not just faculty, but, you know, colleges are, are all in and have the, the personnel being, uh, they have to have a coordinating council related to this project that's going to have, you know, folks from across campus. And so we can start to draw on those folks to, to talk to similar roles at campuses where maybe there is, you know, hesitation or uncertainty or just, you know, unfamiliarity. And uh, I, I think we can venture that way, at least from the Senate perspective, I see us helping to facilitate some of that connection and ongoing education. Um, Randy, Erin. Yes, and I think the other thing is we need to remember that when we just like when we do any equity initiative, there, there's often positive unintended consequences. And so I think as we look through the systems that we are going to have to, we keep talking about change, but we're really gonna to have to augment systems like student support and things like that. And I believe that we will find that as we do that, we actually provide better services to all students. <laughs> So I do think there'll be a positive unintended consequence of us doing this hard work um, for, for our great, for the greater good. And I really uh, like your point about making sure we pay students too. I just want to highlight that. <laughs> Go ahead, Randy. <laughs> uh, of course, no, of course. Um, I was going to mention, um, and this happened with Guided Pathways, it's still fresh in my mind as well. Um, student voice can, is incredibly powerful when it comes to helping people see the benefit, the value of investing time, money, people into change. Um, having, hearing the stories of students who have completed competence, uh, completed a program through CBE can be very powerful. Obviously, if you don't have a CBE program, you, you may not have that readily available, but you can pull from other places and get some of those testimonials that way. But what student voice you do have now is the, the loud voice of students who can't complete, who can't finish what they want because of, of their circumstance, because of the time it takes, et cetera. So the data that we have, and I'll out my own college for a minute, we have uh, over 100 programs that have no completers in, in the last five years. That to me is a loud 
loud voice that we're not doing something we need to be doing. Um, and, and CBE approaching how we administer, how we how we provide instruction and, and, and assess learning is a good place to start. So I think back to the original question of uh, what what, uh, what do we do for people who don't don't want to do it? We just point out that hey, it's not working what we're doing now. Um, so let's do something different. And then again, just pointing out a question of you know where to start with this CB information, and Cheryl put a link to the Vision Resource Center um, in the chat. So, um, are there any final thoughts from any of you? We're we're pretty close to the end of. I this. just there was a question about um, how SLOs and competencies relate, and I. I'd like us to go back to Bloom's taxonomy, perhaps. And if you really look at Bloom's taxonomy, we have formative learning occurring in the early parts um, of that taxonomy, and we have demonstration of it towards the end. And so um, this is just the Aaron point of view, but I've been thinking about how those distinguish um, in that way. So I do think you have foundational student learning outcomes where knowledge is obtained. And then as you move towards competencies, you're demonstrating the application of that knowledge. So did I make sense there? <laughs> I, Absolutely. I, yeah, I was gonna throw in, I saw a question um, regarding changing SLO language to skills and or competencies uh, in regard to the ACC RE standards. And, and I'm not incredibly familiar with, with the ACC RE, I apologize, um, but I'm not sure if changing SLOs uh, is where we want to be right now. I think I think we can talk about the differences enough, well enough, that faculty can understand them. And then, then now we have multiple tools for explaining to students what it is that they're learning, both a, a big picture and a very finite, discrete picture as well. So I hope I'm understanding that question, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go changing. Don't go changing. <laughs> don't go change. It ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We love our SLOs. <laughs> That's right. Right on. Well, thank you so much. What can I say? I'm just just so very grateful for your support, guys. It's 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 always you know good to have uh, academic senate on board speaking to those issues. Uh, thank you, Bethany, uh, for for moderating the discussion. Uh, now um, we are moving on to our evaluation session, right? So so that would be it. I think uh, Susie. Um, has just reminded me that there is a separate link for that. So, so with that, again, I, I just would like to thank everyone for attending. Thank you for your contribution, your support to the, to the, to, uh, of the symposium. Uh, Cheryl, Aaron, Randy, it's been great. Always a pleasure to have you. So thank you so much. And with that, um, we'll, we'll move on to our evaluation part of the, of the symposium. And uh, hey, what can I say? If we don't see you during those Friday SLO talks, we'll, we'll hopefully uh, see you next year. Then take care, guys. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>